Good evening and welcome to the October 14th, 2021 Planning Commission meeting. The Planning Commission advises the City Council on development proposals, development standards, long range planning and transportation issues. Some of the items the Planning Commission has final decision authority and others the City Council will make the final decision. Planning Commission is made up of seven individuals that are appointed on three year terms by the City Council. Tonight we have five, so we do have a quorum. And tonight we have four agenda items in front of us. But before we begin, let's stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, uh, before we get started tonight, again, we do have a uh, public hearing, so I want to make sure, Mr. Markegaard, can you go through the um, procedures for those that might want to participate remotely? Sure. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the Planning Commission, uh, we are in person here for the meeting tonight, and we have uh, audience members who can definitely testify in person as well. But we will also be using uh, WebEx this evening to allow remote testimony, should somebody uh, prefer to testify remotely. Let me share the screen here. Just a second. So the number to call, if you would like to testify remotely is 415-655-0001. Uh, and then once in, you would enter the conference code, which is 2464-6351-239. Uh, and I would mention that we had to make a last minute change tonight. So if you're uh, watching remotely, uh, this is this number was on the agenda materials, but there were two numbers we were hoping to use intercall tonight. They are having server problems, so as a backup, we will use this uh, WebEx number, and we will have it scrolling across the screen tonight for ease of reference. All right, thank you, Mr. Markergaard. Looks like that's already scrolling across the bottom. So, for those at home uh, that might wish to participate, all right. Um, our first item tonight is the Clover Center redevelopment. Looks like Mr. Centenario, you have the staff report for us. I do, thank you, Mr. Chair. So item one on your agenda uh, relates to a, a partial redevelopment of the uh, Clover Center. Are we not able to hear me? This a little better? Okay, not projecting enough. Uh, item one is related to a partial redevelopment of the uh, Clover Center. Uh, it includes uh, three entitlements. One, uh, rezoning to apply the planned development overlay. Uh, and then uh, preliminary development plans to establish uh, plans for future development phases. And final development plans for uh, a partial redevelopment, uh, which predominantly includes a, a new 24,000 square foot grocery store. So I think everyone in the uh, in the room or on the commission is very familiar with Clover Center. It's just to the east of us here. Um, Starbucks is very popular with uh, city staff, um, but certainly includes other tenants. Um, and it's it's been around for quite some time. I think it was a, originally constructed in the late 50s and largely has the same uh, development pattern as it did uh, in the late 50s. And so this, uh, this project will, will go through uh, the development plans in a moment. Uh, but here's just another image of, of the shopping center where it, very traditional suburban uh, uh, development pattern where you have a building and then front field parking between the, the street and the building itself. Uh, a bank uh, occupies the southeast uh, corner of the site. N nothing is proposed to change uh, with that site uh, now, uh, but it is identified as a, a future redevelopment phase. A couple just images of existing conditions. And uh, this provides a good reference uh, between the existing conditions and then uh, what the developer proposal would would bring to the site. As you can see in this image, uh, the parking lot, you know, it really is an outmoded uh, development uh, pattern and, and design. And um, for example, the 
we have requirements related to parking islands and landscaping within parking lots, uh, lighting requirements. And when we have older development like this, it's pretty universal that a lot of our current development standards are not met. Uh, and so when we're reviewing uh, new development, uh, either um, a complete redevelopment or a partial redevelopment like we have tonight, we're really looking at uh, trying to improve, uh, improve that uh, development quality and bring it closer to compliance. This image is along Lindale, and uh, the parking uh, along this side of, um, of the shopping center would remain the same. Uh, there's some facade improvements, which I'll, I'll detail, uh, but largely this, uh, this portion of the shopping center would, would remain um, uh, pretty much the same. Uh, it is identified as a, a future redevelopment phase, which we'll, we'll get into in momentarily. And the one of the elements that was uh, staff was really focused in on uh, related to pedestrian improvements. This uh, image is along 98th Street and between uh, the 35W uh, interchange and the main uh, drive lane, uh, the, the pedestrian environment is, isn't great. And so we have a, a, a curb walk and then a retaining wall, uh, which was installed as part of, a, I believe it was part of a MnDOT project. Um, but uh, it, it does create a very uncomfortable uh, uh, environment or feeling for, fo for folks who are uh, walking or biking. And uh, as you'll see in the plans, uh, that would be improved dramatically. This is just the other side of that uh, image um, looking south uh, towards that retaining wall. There is several feet of grade change, um, but thankfully uh, the applicant uh, is proposing to regrade the parking lot to remove that retaining wall entirely. So touch on the, the rezoning proposal. Uh, the applicant's not looking to change the base zoning district. That would remain as B4, uh, but they are requesting to apply the plan development overlay district. Uh, and the need for that is to uh, allow the city council to approve development flexibility, uh, especially with uh, partial redevelopments or, or redevelopments of older properties. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of those current standards aren't being met. And so we, we try and play a balancing act of uh, making sure that the, the development is closer to code compliance, uh, but we do wanna allow some flexibility uh, when you have a partial redevelopment. Um, it's very, very challenging to be entirely code compliant uh, for, for these types of sites. So going on to the uh, preliminary development plan or PDP. So this is the long-term uh, vision of Clover Center with future redevelopment. You can see uh, phase one is the grocery, of course, and then you have the parking lot between the grocery and 98th Street. Uh, but some other elements uh, of the PDP that are noteworthy is a, a, a north-south uh, road or access road that leads to where Freeway Ford is today. That was a really central component of the uh, Lindo retrofit plan or the green spine, I believe it was called in the plan. Uh, so that, that is a, a key element uh, of the PDP that, um, uh, that we like to see. And then uh, future redevelopment of the uh, northeast corner with a high density mixed use building between with uh, retail space and then uh, a number of residential units in the southeast corner where you have the the bank today there would be they're proposing two future retail spaces although we had some comments on the size and ma making sure that the uh, those future phases are identified or co-compliant in size with uh, pdps we do uh, require a, a, a massing graphic uh, you know with the grocery phase they obviously have the architecture, architectural detail, which was included here, but for future phases, we really wanna see at least the massing. Uh, and so you see a high density building uh, uh, where the uh, residential component would be, and then the, uh, the single level uh, retail and the southeast corner. So getting into the site plan, so we're moving from the PDP to the FDP. So the site plan is what the applicant is looking to build. And again, you see the t uh, roughly 24,000 square foot grocery store uh, the, the parking facilities, that would be, so essentially reconstructing the parking lot, adding in uh, parking islands, uh, removing the retaining wall, and I'll I have a little more uh, detailed graphic from that, but removing the retaining wall along 98th Street and adding a code complying sidewalk. To touch on parking, uh, a lot of the development that we review uh, is proposes less, slightly less than city code requires. We have pretty conservative standards. And uh, 
this this application is no different. Uh, the, dif the difference between the the city code requirement and the proposed supply is about ten and a half percent. And as part of a traffic study, uh, independent engineer took a look at parking demand and found that the proposed parking supply, two hundred twenty six dollars, was more than more than adequate for the proposed uses. So. We're very much supportive of that deviation, and it's it's uh, well within the kind of the range that we've seen uh, within the last few years. So to provide a little more detail on uh, the southwest corner of the site where that retaining wall is, uh, there have been some improvements to ped ramps, uh, and uh, not by the applicant, but I believe by the state. And you can see in this image how the how the parking lot would be graded. So there would still be uh, two to three feet of a grade change, but it's slight enough where a retaining wall wouldn't be needed. Uh, and that accommodates um, an, eight, an eight foot concrete sidewalk with uh, not, a, not a wide boulevard by any means, but at least some boulevard uh, to have a buffer between the sidewalk and the, and the street itself where there isn't one today. And just to touch on other pedestrian improvements, so you can see uh, in this image how you, uh, the how the kind of the southern end of that green spine would be established uh, within Clover Center, and as a code requirement, uh, they they do have a compliant sidewalk that connects the public sidewalk along 98th Street to the building itself, and so this kind of reemphasizes that that uh, central green spine, uh, but then also provides uh, accommodates pedestrians where there there isn't a, a sidewalk on this side of the building today. The landscape plan does uh, does show uh, compliant trees within parking islands. Uh, they're they're a little low on the tree count, uh, but that that's a pretty minor change. I think there's plenty of space to to accommodate some more trees. We, one of the comments that we had was we wanted to see some landscaping uh, immediately south of the grocery building itself. Right now, it's proposed to just be a lot of concrete, and then asphalt of the drive lane. So I think we can we can improve that uh, and meet uh, the 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 requirement based on a disturbance area. So uh, the number of shrubs were were compliant with disturbance area, but well, we would need to see some additional trees, which which we think can be easily accommodated on, within the site plan. Uh, the building elevations, you can see the, the uh, Lake Winds Co-op. Um, one of the notable features is all the glass along the south uh, building elevation. That's something we do want to see, especially in some of our mixed-use districts where we want to have that transparency, uh, especially along streets. Uh, so it was great to see that. And then other materials uh, would be a mixture of brick, uh, metal panels, and uh, architectural panels or fiber cement panels. So a very similar mix of materials that, that we've, we've been seeing lately. So in terms of the material palette, um, you know, there's a little more detail that we're, we're looking for in terms of percentages. We have primary versus secondary allowances. And um, a little more work is needed on the west elevation where, you know, some, some concrete masonry units are identified and that, that's not a permitted material in, the, in a commercial district beyond that uh, secondary allowance. So there's a little work to do, but in terms of the, the mix of materials, uh, we think we can, we can work, work within the code and, and find something that's compliant. No, well, I said the the eastern half, roughly eastern half of the building, uh, the existing building, would remain the same. Uh, they are proposing facade improvements, and so we have some fairly antiquated uh, the the green roof that we're pretty familiar with uh, that would be removed uh, to make way for you know a much more attractive um, facade for the shopping center. So with that, we are recommending approval of both the rezoning and uh, the preliminary and final development plan. And so I have the recommended motions uh, before you. Thank you, Mr. Centenario. Um, any questions from commission members for staff? Go ahead, uh, Commissioner Goldsman. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, could we bring up a pic uh, the overlay um, of the walking paths? So with the green arrows i think sure that one will be good yeah so one of the questions that i have on this is um if a pedestrian is walking from the west on 98th street um from the west going east um so they're crossing 35 to come to this location 
How would the pedestrian get to the grocery store? Would they, would they be able to cut that corner, or would they have to walk all the way over to the part of the uh, crosswalk um, on the east side of the building? Sure, uh, great question, Commissioner Goldsman. Uh, if they wanted to walk on a sidewalk, uh, they would have to uh, go to that that north south spine uh, mm -hmm. to get towards the building. Uh, certainly, there could possibly be a, a secondary uh, sidewalk uh, between the the public uh, sidewalk and the the parking lot. Um, that's not something that was included in the development plans, but I think it's it's a good idea. Uh, if there isn't, mm -hmm. uh, there's probably be an inf informal path that would be established over time. Yeah. Second question. Go, go ahead, Commissioner Goldsmith. Thanks. Uh, the second question I have is around, um, you know, parking, and, and most grocery stores have um, cart corrals. Um, so when looking at the parking requirements, was a cart corral part of the study, and is it something that we're concerned with, taking up spots? Sure, Commissioner Goldsman. Uh, I don't believe the parking st study contemplated uh, cart corrals. Uh, however, there was a, a pretty big delta between what the study thought was the demand and what the supply was. Mm -hmm. So, yes, probably the result is probably a stall or a couple stalls are going to be uh, eliminated uh, for a cart corral or something uh, uh, reorganized uh, to to provide that space, mm -hmm. but even if a few stalls are lost, we still don't have an issue or concern with the parking supply. Okay, and then one last question, if I may. Okay, so one of the things that I see is unique about this is the driveway around the current property to the back side of the building today, that's used for donations for the Salvation Army, and so I'm thinking, with this new development, is that still going to be an allowed use to have um, people drive on the west side of the building all the way around to the back to donate um, like they do today? Commissioner Goldsman, uh, the, or Mr. Chair, Commissioner Goldsman, the, uh, there would be a drive lane behind the, behind the building. It would actually be in the opposite direction, going from east to west. Um, so you can, I don't know if you can kind of make out this little arrow mm -hmm. here, uh, but the Salvation Army is, uh, at least for now, is intended to uh, remain. And so th the donation facility, I think, would, would also remain. Uh, there's a little bit of cleanup that has to happen, uh, maybe some reorganization, because uh, a lot of times the donations kind of find their way into that drive lane and create a pinch point, mm -hmm. uh, which is ob obviously something that doesn't look very good, but then also is potentially an issue for emergency services. Uh, so there's some cleanup that needs to happen, mm -hmm. uh, but the direction of flow, if you will, would be in the opposite direction. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Centenario, just, I, I know the, the parking deviation is 10.5%. I, I, I missed uh, the number of stalls that that's equivalent to. Uh, let's see. Somewhere around 25? Roughly, yep. Okay, that's all. That's all. That's all I need to know. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, uh, um, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Sensenario, in um, on page four of the staff report, we where we typically get the overview of um, requirements for a specific uh, for the code. We talk and you and you always give us information about whether it's compliant, whether there's deviation requested, et cetera. Um, in table one, we have the list of the requirements. One of the things I didn't see in there was for B4 zoning, the minimum and maximum building setbacks. Can you share with me and those present um, what those are and why those may not be included in this analysis? Sure. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Roman. No, that's, that's a great question. It's something that we had to deal with as part of our development review. Um, and it gets into a, a little bit of a challenging um, nonconformity uh, issue with uh, uh, equivalency or substantially equivalent and uh, and essentially what that means is the but to answer your question there's a there is a maximum setback in the b4 district and that's uh, 40 feet i believe and certainly the grocery store is not proposed to be uh, within 40 feet of 98th street so uh, our preference would have been that the the grocery store is located much closer to 98th street 
um, more similar to the, the Lake Winds location in Richfield, where you have you know a entrance real close to the sidewalk as well as to the parking facility. Um, that's not what the applicant ultimately proposed. Ultimately, uh, and the the issue at hand is whether or not the proposed grocery store is substantially equiv equivalent to the existing building uh, as it is today. So, in our, under our nonconformity standards, uh, a property owner can replace uh, an existing building uh, in it, even if it's not compliant, uh, and we call that substantially equivalent. So, it wouldn't be subject to the maximum setback requirement in the B4 district. Uh, so, while it would be our preference that it's code complying. Uh, that's not what the applicant uh, applied for, and we do believe it, it, it. Our interpretation was that it's substantially equivalent. Okay, and could you um, very high level uh, background on the substantially equivalent? Is that something we've had for a long time? Is that something that we initiated? Something that was initiated elsewhere? Yeah, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Roman, I, I don't think it's a, that term has existed for very long. I think it's a result of. Uh, a lit Court cases, I believe, but I don't. I don't know the timeline. I don't know, Glenn, if you. Sure, uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Roman. Um, not too long ago, I'm guessing five to ten years ago, the state statutes were amended uh, in regards to nonconformity. There was new language that said that uh, a nonconforming or nonconformity in general can be continued through, uh, among other things, replacement. So the question is, what is replacement? And our city code uses the term substantially equivalent to get a replacement. So if the, if the uh, square footage is very similar, the placement is very similar, uh, we consider it to be substantially equivalent and therefore um, uh, eligible to be replaced under the nonconformity statute. Thank you. And then one last question on that vein. Um, would that determination be independent of or reliant on the the preliminary phase that, that shows the facility connected to the other facility versus in the final phase where it's not connected? Would that have an impact on that determination or not? Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Roman, you know, the, the phase one with the grocery uh, is in the future independent of, of those future phases. So in this particular case, I don't, I don't think it has an impact on that interpretation. Thank you, that's all for now. All right, any other commissioners with questions for staff? All right, oh, Commissioner Goldsman. Thanks, thanks Mr. Chair. One other question um, that came up when Commissioner Roman was talking was really around that packet information and it came to mind is, there was a letter, I think it was from Hennepin County, who had proposed for the sidewalk to be 10 feet, not eight feet. Can you talk a little bit about um, the differences and how we came up with the current design? Sure, uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner. Uh, the, the city standard is for eight feet. Um, and so one of the comments that the, the county had was they also, uh, I think they requested a much wider boulevard uh, with a six-foot sidewalk. A six-foot sidewalk would not have been compliant with the city code. So it really was trying, uh, this design is trying to balance having some boulevard uh, where there's none today and having a code compliant sidewalk. Um, so the uh, we do have cases where uh, there is a 10-foot walk. Uh, if it's bituminous, it's generally considered a, like a trail. Uh, but in this case, we do require a minimum eight foot of concrete. Um, and, and that is a code complying width. Thank you for the clarification. All right. Any other questions, comments from commissioners? For staff, not seeing any. Um, is the applicant available tonight? If you would like to speak, um, the table is yours. Just please identify yourself and write your name down, and, and then uh, we can begin. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Tim Marco. I'm the Director of Development with Kraus Anderson uh, Development Company. I just want to uh, introduce myself, um, kind of give a little bit of background. We've been working for a couple years more intensely, probably almost for a decade prior uh, on this shopping center. Ideas, thoughts, kind of how we've gotten to where we are today. Um, I can address a couple of things that have come up so far, if that's okay. You know, we've we've looked at orienting the building in, I would say, 
just about every single capacity we could to try and balance where things are going to go, how it's going to play today into the future phases, um, the site constraints with the stormwater management system to the southwest, the importance of eventually Aldrich kind of going through the site, landed us into the position we're in right now on the south or on the northwest corner of the site uh, with the with the potential grocery store. We are very hopeful that this is going to be the catalyst for the future phase. We have quite a bit of work left to do beyond this meeting. We've got to work with our existing tenants. We've got to work with city staff to finalize the design and get all of our ducks in a row, essentially, to actually get to the next city council meeting. So I think hopefully this is received as a, a, a good first step and um, we'll continue to get back to work with city staff and, and organizing our components. Uh, we're not ready to break ground if, if there's any questions there until next year sometime. So we intend to, to continue our planning stages and, and get organized in an uh, effort to bring this uh, development to the community. All right, thank you, Mr. Marco. Any commission members with questions or comments for Mr. Marco? Go ahead, Commissioner Cookton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Marco, was there any consideration of making this a mixed-use structure, five stories of apartments or something like that on, on top? Um, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Commissioner. I uh, personally worked on a previous plan that had, uh, I believe, five over two with a grocery store. Uh, it didn't work out the way we'd hoped it was, which is kind of how we got back to this position. And so I think... Learning from that experience with staff, with the site, with the market at that time, we were uh, a little bit more, I would say, anxious that the building, the residential building along Lindale would bring more activity once the grocery store is actually in place. So that first phase would be the catalyst to bring the rooftops into our site and then kick off the mixed use phase that we showed in the preliminary development plan. As you saw, there was some retail that would play into that too. We would change some of the access points as well and kind of finish off the rest of the shopping center. All right. Any other question, Commissioner Roman? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Marker, you mentioned uh, all the different permutations and I know that many considerations go into site design, especially in a reuse. Um, can you talk about um, the challenges or the opportunities with a, a facility that I think Mr. Centenario compared the facility in Richfield. So for example, a, a, a facility that maybe had a 90 degree turn face the east, but came closer to 98th Street and, and why that would or wouldn't work from your assessment. Yes, great question, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner. I think the biggest issue from the orientation along 98th Street is honestly the stormwater management system that's in place to the southwest. The The grade changes are significant. It was quite a bit of work on our side, and it's still a work in progress, honestly, from a budgetary standpoint to balance that site and, and coordinate it all. And so I think when we pushed that building along 98th, even at a 90-degree angle, there, there just wasn't enough parking with Aldrich coming through with the grade changes with the stormwater management system and having to reorganize all of that to get away from the building. Then we have a loading issue that comes in as well because we can't load along 98th. So we have to load along the backside of there, and that's where the primary source of parking would have been as well. It just became a continuing mounting issue to try and solve, and that's how we got back to where we are today. Thank you. All right, uh, Commissioner Cook, then, you have an additional question? I do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Marco, you said you've been working on this for a long time. And uh, in that time, I would say we um, approved the Lindell Avenue retrofit plan, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Can you talk about how that may or may not have changed your site design and what considerations may have been modified uh, based on that? Sure. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner. I think the biggest change for us was how we re-envisioned the residential, the density component. We have some work still to do on the hard corner of Lindale and 98th. I know those building sizes don't comply. Uh, we heard feedback at the DRC that um, you know we could get a little bit more creative. That That plan that we put forward is something we think works for the area plan, the overlay district. Um, you know, I think the biggest 
the biggest change that we brought out was having those two phases play off of each other. I would say originally the Aldrich um, idea was a little bit of a uh, an obstacle for our project to draft a road through the middle of it that doesn't go anywhere yet. But I think we were able to come up with a plan that makes more sense along Lindale and really kind of, I think, satisfies phase one view corridors. It's tucked into 35, but still brings the presence of Lindale Avenue with the density and the height and the mixed use to match the area plan. Uh, Mr. Cincinnati, could you flip to the PDP if you don't mind? And I just want to be clear uh, with the Aldrich connection is this is pretty much what you're envisioning for the, the final site development here is that's that's how our sort of that curved connection to Aldrich is what that would look like. I would say that likely those parking stalls would not exist in that plan. I think we would we would try and straighten that out so that there isn't that curve that comes around those five or six parking stalls there. So instead you would have a little bit of a curb along that adjacent retail bay. And the just for clarity, the, the, the importance or the reason that that singular retail bay exists is because that will be new construction along with the grocery store. So everything to the east is existing shopping center. And in the future, that those parking stalls likely would not be there. They're on the plan today, but most likely to keep that road as straight as we can get it. Thank you. All right. Any commissioners with other questions for the applicant? Not seeing any. All right, thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. All right, at this time, we'll go ahead and open up the public hearing. Um, on this item, is there anybody from the public that would like to speak to this item? Anybody from the public in this room? We'll start with that. Um, not seeing any. Mr. Markergaard, is there anybody online or that is called in? Sure, uh, Mr. Chairman, again, we had to make a last minute change to WebEx. So I will check in with a few names that I don't necessarily recognize or maybe ask staff. Uh, uh, Mr. Whitrock, I will unmute you now. Okay, I hear from staff that is a, a member of the applicant team. Okay. Same thing there. So we do not have any names that we do not recognize um, that are not here for other items. Okay. All right. So um, seeing that there are no other people from the public online or in the room that would like to speak to this item, I'd entertain a uh, motion to close public hearing. So moved. All right. We have a motion to close public hearing. Is there a second? Second. All right. Commission members, we have a motion and a second to close public hearing. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, motion carries. Public hearing is now closed. All right, commission members, discussion on this particular item in front of us. Commissioner Goldsman. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll go first. Um, first of all, I, I'm really excited to see that there is new development in this corner. I think it is our downtown, um, and, and seeing that there's new life and development is exciting, um, especially with the new orange line and then obviously with the Lindale Avenue retrofit. So a few comments that I have is, um, you know, I mentioned the walkway or the sidewalk from the west to the east. I live on the west side of, of 35 and I could see myself walking to this grocery store and um, not having a sidewalk on the west side I think would be um, uh, a challenge um, and so I would um, ask staff and the applicant if possible to add um, some sort of sidewalk so that we're not thinking the other application we called it a cow path um, and so I, I'd, I'd like some type of um, of walkway there um, I understand that there's challenges obviously with uh, moving the building further to uh, toward 98th Street but I think what they've done is really just heightened the visibility. Under we understand that there's water, um, storm stormwater retention, and mitigation. Um, so I, I I'm okay with the placement of it. I think it retains the, the existing character, but with the second phase, I think that's where we can really shine. Um, and then the last thing I had is I really enjoy that they're building in um, the street for Aldrich. You know, using that green. 
fine um, that we've talked through, um, having that street go through is really going to add value, especially for those residents that get off the orange line, maybe live in the area, and then utilize places like Veep, which is right on the other side of Aldrich, that this road will will go to eventually. So the only thing I have to say is on the Aldrich, Aldrich um, road is let's make it as green as we can. You know, looking at the designs here, um, it does look like there's quite a bit of, uh, you know, s cement and, and hardscape. So how can we make it as green as possible mm. with planters or, um, ba you know, baskets and things like that just to, to liven it up and make it p pedestrian friendly. So those are just some comments that I have. But overall, I think it's great. I'm, I'm excited to see some new life in the Clover Center and Maybe we'll just plant clover everywhere and <laughs> and in lieu of the the name so i'm excited that's what i have to say thank you commissioner goldsman uh any other comments from commissioners commissioner cookton thanks mr chair i have a number of thoughts um and i think a lot of them go back to the lindale avenue retrofit plan which was sort of a something this commission and city council worked on for a long time. And it's uh, something that has a lot of momentum right now. And it's something that's very fresh in our minds because we just approved it uh, six months ago or so. And this is at the heart of the Lindale Avenue retro plan. Um, when we approved that plan, uh, it was the 98th and Lindale node and it was, I believe, 86th and Lindale were the two nodes that we really um, were recommended to be sensitive about and really be careful about. And we're at the heart of that, and particularly with the Orange Line, which is very soon to open. Uh, this is right across the street from the Orange Line, and, and it's giving us a lot of potential for redevelopment, and it's very important that we do a good job in, in providing access to that new amenity that we're, that's being given to our residents. And so uh, I went back and looked at the Lindell Avenue retrofit plan and tried to understand what what was the intent of that plan and what we're what were the recommendations and what were they trying to, to push us to do as we reimagine that corridor? Uh, one of the big things that we've already talked about was the old Aldrich Green Spine, the connection of 98th Street um, uh, via Aldrich and um, giving people access to the new BRT, the bus rapid transit stop. And when I look at the final development plans for sure, um, we're not there yet with the connection, but maybe you can overlook that if we're seeing uh, what we were hoping for in the preliminary development plan, sort of the, the future look at it. And that's what we have up, well, at least that's what I have up on my screen still. And um, that doesn't look like how I imagine the Aldrich uh, green spine to look. Uh, I mean, it was uh, sort of envisioned as a green tree-lined oasis for pedestrians and cyclists to get to the BRT station from future residential uses to the north. And what I'm seeing in this plan uh, looks a lot more like a parking lot connection, which although transversible, I mean, we all walk from our cars to Target, right? There's nothing terrible about it. I don't think it's an amenity. And when we're talking about the Lindale Avenue retrofit plan and what we can do as a city to catalyze new development, we're talking about amenities and making things more than and really trying to spur new development by creating amenities for our residents. And I don't think a connection through a parking lot to the new bus rapid transit stop is what is what we had in mind with the Lindell Avenue retrofit plan. So I, I have problems with that. Um, going back to the Lindell Avenue retrofit plan, uh, what, what that plan was trying to tell us, and I just made a few notes of the, the major themes of that. I've talked about the Aldrich Greenspine. The other things were um, parking interior to the site, increased density, ground level activation, and walkability. And as much as I, I like the idea of the amenity of the grocery store, I don't think we're accomplishing any uh, of those goals. Uh, the parking's not interior to the site. We're not increasing the density. Um, we're not activating the ground level near the sidewalk, and we are hardly making it more walkable, in, in my opinion. And so I think. I think we've missed the mark on this, and I, I certainly appreciate there are challenges, uh, and um, and I, I guess I have more comments, but maybe I'll stop there for now. But um, 
I, I, I have a hard time seeing how this conforms to the Lindale Avenue retrofit plan, which ties into required finding number one, which says the proposed development uh, has to conform to the, um, the 2040 comprehensive plan. And I, I don't think I'm able to make that required finding. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Cookton. Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, you know, I'm going to build on the things that Commissioner Cookton has said and um, being, you know, as I move farther up the, the row here, becoming one of the old timers here now. Um, this also goes back further than the Lindale Avenue retrofit to when we worked on the 98th Street station area plan, which those elements are in the Lindale Avenue retrofit. But you know, we were talking three years ago about, which is when we rezoned this, this area um, and Maybe it's my own naivety, and I should have dug deeper, but um, I would not have uh, envisioned that the B4 would have led to um, a B4 with a with a building that's allowed to be set back anywhere from uh, six to 25 times as far as we intended. Um, with that, um, and again, that no uh, no uh, knock on the applicant. This is their. This is what the code allows, um, and so. They can propose that there, and then we we are tasked with finding if it's if it's a, a match, right? And I think the area that it doesn't fit for me as well is is in the comprehensive plan part with that, you know, the the sea of parking, which is in itself would be one thing, but when you have it immediately adjacent to a six lane freeway plus a, a half clover loop. It's just it, you have a broad stretch of what we've talked about in some of these plans, especially in the station area plan, about not being a pedestrian-friendly area. And then we go into another, almost well, the block of, of not improving that situation. So, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of great stuff in this proposal. I mean, the, the housing, the, the refreshed retail, you know, another type of grocery. We have grocery in this area, but this is a different kind of market of, of grocery. And so... You know, perhaps again, I'm not a I'm not a designer, I'm not a developer, um, but you know, even if the grocery was where the housing is, and the housing later came along and went where the parking, I mean, again, I'm not the designer, but and I, I appreciate that there's challenges, but I, I too do not find that this is consistent with the comprehensive plan part of it, uh, and so uh, there again, all the things that I like about this, I just can't get past. This is one of those times, and you know, many of you hear me talk about when I go on about sidewalks and residential. And every time we rebuild a street, that's a 50-year decision that we've decided not to put a sidewalk somewhere in a neighborhood for 50 years, essentially. Well, that's kind of what this is. You know, the, the current center has been there for, it sounds like, 65 years. And, and, and that's a good life for a, for a building. You know, this grocery store goes here in this location. That's a 60, 50, 60-year 60 decision to have um, on this corridor that we've said is, should be a certain way. Uh, it's, it's not. So um, that's where I'm at right now. All right. Um, anybody else? Commissioner uh, Robbie? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yep. All right. uh, Mr. Centenario, could you, do we have an aerial plan of this site that kind of looks at surrounding uses? Because I have circled and I've written like buildings to the street, pedestrian friendliness is what I have been jotting down, like circling it around. Um, I can certainly bring up our, uh, our GIS system to have a broader view if that would yeah, be helpful. I guess what I'm trying to get at is like this is I think enough to um, and I think I drove by here <laughs> coming and I do stop by Starbucks too <laughs> and I'm glad that that's staying. Uh, first of all I'm really excited about the, all the uses that's coming to the site and, and the density that is coming to the site um, especially the housing component but there is a sea of parking right at the four corners of this area um, and to maybe refresh uh, staff presentation or is the entire building going away and it's a refresh in development or is there I think I heard uh, the applicant or staff say that a portion of the building will stay um, so it, the skeleton of the use uh, the building that's there currently will stay and they're building on it on additions to it or is that revisions to the or are they just knocking everything out and rebuild the grocery store separately with the phases for the developments on the other side is that Am I understanding this correctly? Mr. Chair, Commissioner Abdi, so roughly speaking, the west west half of the existing building would be demolished and uh, rebuilt with new construction. The east half uh, would, if the bones, if you will, would remain uh, as they are today uh, with, with new facades. 
Yeah, I guess what I'm trying to get at is I, I agree with Commission um, that we are deviating from the adopted plans in this sense, but at the same time recognizing that the applicant is working with a, a partial existing building. So if this was a complete teardown and the applicant were to propose, you know, a new development with the uses as proposed, then I feel like I would have had a much stronger push to moving the grocery to the street um, and, you know, kind of encouraging for more street level pedestrian friendliness, uh, but also recognizing that one, obviously they're working with an existing building partially, but also recognizing there's already a sea of parking loading um, around the intersection. So I'm not sure what, what does friend, uh, pedestrian friendliness actually mean. In my context, if I were in Minneapolis or St. Paul, that density, um, you know, apartments and uh, commercial stores are built right to the street and parking is in the back. And maybe this is a city of Bloomington code revision that we can look at, which I was hopefully gonna propose that one of our last agendas is if we have something like that um, to look at. But in this case, I feel like I would be comfortable approving the proposal as proposed because there is an existing use, existing building that they're working with and not a complete teardown. So I don't know if that was a question or a comment, but I'll just leave it at that. I'll take it for what it was, Commissioner Abdi, and, and uh, uh, I guess uh, I'll go with some of my thoughts. And I can certainly appreciate uh, Commissioner Cookdown and Commissioner Roman's thoughts. Um, I think in if we were uh, to the point of redeveloping the whole parcel, I, I, I don't see this as passing. I really don't. Um, but the fact that this is only a partial redevelopment, um, I think mm, where I'm at with this is there is benefit uh, to the city. Um, just even mentioning this to my wife, for instance, um, the discussion was, oh, yeah, that's a terrible walking place. That would be great to have a, a wide sidewalk. So I think from the layman's terms, yes, it's a little bit better. Is it the greatest thing in the world? Uh, no, probably not. Um, but I think where the applicant is going to have – a real challenge is getting to what the commission wants to see for the next phase. Um, Cause I'm looking at this and what they've kind of provided uh, in that, that uh, east, the corner, I don't think that does it. Um, the building in the future phases, that's along Lindale. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, there's some benefit there. And again, I'm keeping in context, um, to some degree that the interstate is right next to this. The interstate is not a walkable area uh, and it's never gonna be um, a place that people enjoy being around. Um, so what we can do with this corner, I think is beneficial. Uh, the trees, I think as staff have mentioned, um, making an ADA and I'll say ADA compliant connection at the signal to the parking, uh, to the building uh, would help facilitate and certainly understand that there's an upcoming study to look at the interchange. I think that plays a big part in this because we don't know um, what that might kick out or what that uh, may push. But if that were to affect a uh, potential location of the store itself, right? So there's a whole nother you could um, potentially have issues with... Um, shall I say, maybe getting a substandard design on that as well. So either way, we're forced to look at where our, our priorities are. Um, I think in my mind, this being a, a development that's leaving some of the existing facility um, is a, certainly a lot better than what we have. It's not ideal. I'd like to see the green spine as a green spine as well. I think that's, um, I remember looking at this and thinking, so as a green spine, you're going to drive by a, a in the future phase, what would be a, a ramp down into the basement? Well, that would be a lot of fun, right? I mean, as a walkable, no, it's not. Um, so I think what ultimately I'm saying here uh, for commission members, from my standpoint, I can support the current development and the idea that this is a planned, but that they really need to uh, do their homework on the next phases is I don't think this gets it there. So um, with that, I would support 
um, the current with the addition of a condition for an ADA compliant sidewalk connection or connection to the parking lot at the very least um, at the signal location because I think to the point coming from the west not only do you have to walk across the interstate you have to walk across the parking lot cross the entrance which I think the county already um, kind of had some comments about cars and conflict and uh, some of that for the future but then to walk up and then walk back to the west to get into the entrance of the grocery store doesn't make any sense to me. People won't do that. Not, not able-bodied. They'll cut across. So, Commission members, Commissioner Crookton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to touch on something Commissioner Roman said because I had the same note on my list. Um, very hard to redevelop this and it's going to be a long time with a commercial note yep. and and with the usage we're seeing here a grocery store you're not gonna be able to put anything in that lot because you're gonna hide the grocery store and that's never gonna work for that applicant and so to Commissioner Roman's point this this is a 60-year decision here and in 60 years Commissioner Avdi and I will be in our 90s and my fellow commissioners may may not, may not <laughs> Don't be. go there and so <laughs> Um, that's a that's a big decision and we got to think about the precedent we're setting here this is the very first application we're seeing after the Lindale Avenue retrofit plan and we've got a long ways to go on that plan and I hope we're thinking about precedent um, our former Commissioner Goodrum would always mm -hmm. remind us of that and being that I'm in his seat now I guess I should advise the same that we do need to think about the precedent we're setting here but there are a lot of existing buildings on on Lindale they're all going to have challenges and I think it's us for for us to decide what do we want that vision to be our and I'm not going to try to sway or advocate for anybody else but from my position I'm not ready to set the precedent that uh, we're going to bend here and bend over here and you know it's uh, death by a thousand cuts and we we don't end up with what we what we've envisioned and that's why I'm unable to make required finding number one we have a vision for this plan to be to be totally blunt I don't find this to be very even close to that vision and I'm I'm not able to support it tonight all right Commissioner cook done thank you Commissioner Roman thanks I just had well, one is not a comment about this project specifically but I was you know I had some background on this um, the, the the part of our code that allows essentially this this kind of a redevelopment, and I, I just I need to be on the record that once again, um, you know, the state has usurped local control for something that really is not at all in the state's interest. And so I think I just need to be on the record about you know we we have this conversation every time we're asked to approve a small cell tower for a cellular, and it's a it's a procedural use of time because we have no authority over that. So here's another example where the state has come in and said that. The legislature knew better than us what our city needed. Um, again, this is not a reflection on the applicant. This is a reflection on uh, how our government does and doesn't work. But um, and I heard some of my fellow commissioners talk about being able to support this because it was a partial redevelopment of the of the building. But in in my view, it, the there is a, a full development plan, and the full development plan. This is not part of the other building. This is a separate building. Uh, as part of a development plan. So for me, I, I, I can't make that that leap to, it's a redevelopment of a partial building. I think it may be connected to there now to make that more of a convenient argument. Um, but uh, I guess, again, for me, I'm with Commissioner Cook and I don't find this to be consistent, um, but you know, we have a body with different opinions and we'll go where the votes go. And this is a city council final public hearing. So um, we are a recommending body. Go ahead, uh, Commissioner Abdi. I don't mean to flip-flop here, and I can be convinced. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we have, looking at the previous map that you had on that looked at the intersection of the sea of parking, and considering that a lot of these uses are long-term, um, and these developments, I should say. So if we were to, if I were to support something like a partial development for the grocery store and not the entire development, um, I guess my support for this would be for the grocery phase i'd be okay with as is but the new development being more pedestrian friendly and actually being in compliance with the plan that were adopted just for clarification um, but 
for the other activities that are surrounding this site, the other parcels, I should say, that have huge parking spots on the front, should they come back and say, I want to do a partial redevelopment um, for consistency in approving documents, I should say, and plans. Mm. Um, if they were to come back and they say, hey, I also want to redevelop this site and add, I don't know, multi-stories to my one-story, whatever building that they have, but not necessarily change the layout, but do add landscaping and all this other stuff that's required, but the sea of parking is still there and nothing is changing, but we would be allowing development and redevelopment or um, retrofitting of existing buildings to densify the sites, but not necessarily changing to meet the approved plans. So then what would be the purpose of the approved plans if we are able to bend and say we are comfortable with partial redevelopments and not necessarily putting our foot down as city and saying partial, I know it's going to cost you a lot of money to do a complete demo, but demo the thing if you want to build it and um, comply with the code. So I don't know. We don't want to scare developers away. I would love to you guys to continue doing the work that you do, but like where does it stop, I guess, is what I, the guidance that I would be looking for in the future is to be consistent in approving projects for me to be comfortable with the partial demo and partial reuse of a, the, the existing building for the grocery store and ensuring the, the next phases of this larger scale development meets with a plan is what we're approving today just for the grocery store for this phase or are we approving for the larger context of the site is the clarification that I guess I would ask. Mr. Markgaard? Sure, uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Abdi, you are uh, being asked to review and take action on both the preliminary development plan and the final development plan. So, the, you know, the final development plan, which is phase one, is shown here on the screen, um, but you are also asked to review and approve that preliminary plan, which is the future phases. So you want to consider both. Commissioner Cookton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Centenario, when we see a preliminary development plan, is there any guarantee that that's what we're going to see in the future, or what is there anything binding about that document? Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Cookton, uh, so preliminary development plan, you know, I'm not sure legally the what that entitlement entails in terms of property, property rights. Um, it does set the the general scheme of uh, future phases, uh, development intensity. Uh, there are no guarantees that that is what uh, comes forward uh, for future phases. We have uh, property owners and developers that look to change their preliminary development plans. Uh, you, it's quite often uh, that you have an evolution of P PDPs over time. Um, but unfortunately, I, I don't know how much rights are vested uh, with the PDP approval because the city uh, we don't have the authority to, to force a future phase of a PDP within a particular uh, timeline. Um, I don't know, Glenn, if you could expand on that. Sure. Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Cookton, it does, it sets the stage for the future. And while an applicant can apply to amend the plan, that would become the starting point. Um, for any future discussions. If, if there were a request down the road to, to change it, we would refer back to what was acted upon tonight or, or ultimately by the city council soon. Um, that would be the starting point for any discussion on an amendment. Commissioner Goldsman. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, back to the question about what, what substantiates re redevelopment versus teardown. I think that's a really good question. So one question that I had is I'm looking at the site plan here and we've got 24,000 square feet for the grocery and then 1,800 for the new retail. Can you tell us what is the remaining square footage that's the original building um, that will be standing until the second development takes place? Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner, I think I can find that. I think it's roughly, um, well, let's see. I, I don't, I don't want to uh, tell you something that's inaccurate, so let me see if I can find it quick. While you're looking, the reason why I ask is if 
the redevelopment is more than 50% of the total site plan, then I would consider that not to be existing substantially, what was the term that we used? Substantial. Substantially equivalent. Equivalent. If it's less than 50%, then I can see where that logic kind of rolls in, right? Because it's using the same footprint or the same building size. But if they're redeveloping more than half of the existing building by square footage, and it's essentially doing a new building, right? I'm just trying to put some numbers around this to, to frame it up for yeah, other developments name. and setting precedents. So if they want to, you know, put two more stories on, then you're doing, you know, that would be 30% versus 50%. See what I'm, I'm saying? Mr. Mark Gart? Like yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioner Goldsman. Ultimately, it goes back to the state statute language on nonconformity, uh, which, as amended, allows uh, a property owner to replace a nonconformity. So imagine uh, a, uh, a building, as long as you replace it, uh, under our code in a manner that's substantially equivalent. Uh, you can do so even though it's not conforming, um, even if it's 100% of the building. So really the, the uh, one precedent I can think of is the Wendy's on American Boulevard in the Penn American District. That was a case where we have similar zoning that requires buildings close to the street, parking on the rear, uh, there was an older Wendy's there that was torn down and replaced. Um, and there again, given the state law, was interpreted to be substantially equivalent, and we weren't able to say, oh, now you need to move the building up to the street. So, yeah, even at a 100% or 50 or 20%, it would be the same situation. Any other thoughts, Commission members? You're starting to get me to think here. I mean, it, it, my little speech was I, I'm okay with the grocery store based on the preliminary plan, but we are truly approving the starting point, as you said, for future development. And that, I mean, part of it is okay, the existing plan or the the new grocery store would fit in with the plan. Okay, yeah, I think it does with the plan, but I don't think the plan is right, the preliminary plan. Um, and this is why we have these discussions. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Cookton. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I think uh, one, of, one of the places I was coming from was not only are we talking about the Lindell Avenue retrofit plan, we're talking about the parcel that is directly across the street from what might be the number one focus point of the Lindell Avenue retrofit plan, which is the new Orange Line stop at South at uh, South Wilmington Transit Center. And we're hoping that, you know, we talk all the time transit-oriented development, right? And and what what does the Orange Line do for us? And uh, this uh, this doesn't... Um, I struggle with finding this as transit-oriented development. Okay. Commissioner Abdi, do you have a comment? I am flip-flopping like I don't know. Um, but I, I recognize, I understand development, I understand the zoning code, I um, recognize the challenges a developer would have to go through to go, coming back. But I also try, I'm trying my best to not think a hardship of redeveloping the site or reconfiguring this site, uh, the hardship being the financial reasons, I, th I don't think we are as commission, sh I don't think one of the findings says, does not say that we have to consider the applicant's financial burden, uh, but I do empathize with that fact that you have to um, reconfigure that. Um, I guess just for final clarification on my part, the nonconformity part for the site um, is this site currently non-conforming? And is the alterations, and I know that they can keep and change and um, modify their non-conforming uses without completely changing it, correct? So we can't, if the site is currently non-conforming, and the, is the, I'm sorry, can you clarify a little bit more about the non-conformity for this site? I know you gave an example, but Mr. how is this sure. site non-conforming and, um, 
based on the staff recommendation for approval, how is this um, continuing to be consistent with the uh, nonconformity? Mr. Mark. Sure. Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Abdi. Uh, when, well, first of all, the site was developed many, many years ago in the 1950s, but even more recently, probably up until three years ago, I think we rezoned to B4. Uh, the previous zoning allowed buildings to be built with parking in front and set back quite a ways. Um, so this building was legally conforming at the time it was uh, built, but once it was rezoned, it became legally non-conforming uh, because the new zoning before requires buildings to be built close to the street, parking to the side and rear. And uh, so as proposed, the proposed building is definitely non-conforming. However, uh, state statute does allow that non-conformity to continue to exist. Uh, through replacement, and it talks about other factors. It says uh, maybe continued including through repair, replacement, restoration, maintenance, or improvement. But in this case, uh, replacement is the key term. So the question is, are they replacing an existing non-conforming building? And city code talks about substantially equivalent. And because uh, the square footage and location is uh, very similar to what exists on the site today. Uh, therefore, we interpret it to be substantially equivalent to what exists and then under state law, uh, eligible to be replaced. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. It kind of helps me ground it. Um, I'm back to square one. I'm in support of as proposed. Uh, my only question goes back to the larger context of the plans that we have adopted and the non-conformity of a lot of these properties that are surrounding this area if the zoning has changed since they were developed. And sh you know, what does that mean for a plan that we have adopted now that says, let's move buildings closer to the, uh, to the site, to the street, uh, but if applicants are now opting for choosing to stay within their non-conformity rights and alter and restore their buildings, add more density, but still not comply with plans that we have adopted. I guess the ch that's the challenge that I'm having right now is how do we stick to the plans that we have adopted and continue to create that vision that we have established while it's also not chasing away development that is knocking on our door. So um, sticking to my guns, I am comfortable supporting this plan as proposed. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just going to go back to this a little bit uh, from my standpoint, again, there's a little bit of this that if you have a grocery store, you have to have parking. Um, and I certainly understand that and maybe how that works on the site. That's not for us to necessarily determine. But I think the other part is I'm okay with parking where it is. Um, but I'm not okay with the density. And what I'm trying to rectify here in my head, Commission members, is um, to understand what each of us um, may or may not support in this. So uh, whichever way uh, this decision may go, the uh, City Council hears that loud and clear. And so um, I... I if we can go through that one more time and maybe uh, with a little more brevity just to make sure we're all uh, very clear as this moves forward. Again, right now, I think the plan for the grocery store, it is what it is. Um, they're, they're doing as best they can with the plan that they've provided. I don't agree with the preliminary plan. All right, so um, commission members, if, if you can, I, I'd appreciate going through that mm -hmm. uh, prior to uh, any larger discussion about a motion or anything. Commissioner Goldsman. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I would agree with you. I, I, I am okay with the grocery store as, it, as it's laid out. Um, I do um, 
understand the parking and, and um, the challenges. I, I do want to see a walkway from uh, on um, from the west to the east, um, just for people to walk um, to the grocery store versus having to go all the way to the, the um, Aldrich. Um, and then the other thing is, so talking about the overall development plan, this is where I get stuck is the overall development plan. I really look at the corner and the corner just, maybe it's just there's not enough detail for me to see how that would really play out and how we could activate that corner. I think the corner is really where we can shine, mm -hmm. um, and and I'm just not seeing it. Okay. Um, I think the housing is great. The retail will be uh, fine, um, but the, the corner is what sticks out to me as being a challenge. But the grocery store as it is, I think will be a good asset for the community and and for residents and it's on it's on 35 it's going to be industrial in nature anyways uh, so that's just my my feedback okay thank you commissioner roman thank you mr chair i think um my my issues are all about um uh, relationship to the street and so whether that be um the grocery itself um, again, understand challenges the site, challenges with whatever, um, you know, but, and I know there's costs associated, but structured parking underneath is an option. I mean, it, just because, uh, anyways, I'm not, I'm mm -hmm. not here to redesign it for the applicant. Um, so, and, and in the, in the final development or the preliminary development, excuse me, you know, even that area, we've got more parking proposed along, uh, along the street, uh, east of Aldrich. So. So it's about that. And I know one of our other things that we called for was um, an elimination of the free right uh, over time. Mm -hmm. One of our goals, that was back when we talked about the station area plan. And so, again, that changes. You know, right now, that's a racetrack. It comes into it's a dedicated lane. You just fly through there at full speed. Um, so that changes what that corner would become as well. So, uh, yeah, so for me, it's just about um, what we're presenting at, as Commissioner Cookton talked about, right across the street from our prime station in the area um, and the heart of what was once considered to be Bloomington's downtown. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Roman. Commissioner Abdi? Um, hopefully y'all remember what I said because I don't remember what I said. I, I think I'm fine with the grocery as is due to the nonconformity definition. I think we're bound by that to some extent. Um, and when we say, uh, you know, buildings to the street, I feel like the two, um, the apartments and the other retail and then the corner, um, I think the corner can, maybe we should see more, a little bit more density at the corner, but I, when it comes to the language that I'm hearing about, you know, s closer to the street, I think the other two, two developments on the, on each side, the, the apartment and the, the corner, technically meets the building to the street level almost. Um, I don't know what the setbacks are from this uh, view here. Um, without nitpicking too much, I feel like I would be in support of this. Um, I don't know what the view would be like from the Lindell. Is it the Lindell side? Um, so I don't know what this view would be like because we're still in the very early mm -hmm. um, stages of the development. So I we're only looking at, at the aerial view right now and we're having a lot of conversations about the street level. We don't really know what the street level looks like from a major component of the development. So okay. we're shooting blanks. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Abdi. Commissioner Cookton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my primary concerns are how this relates to the Lindell Avenue retrofit plan. I believe the Lindell Avenue retrofit plan called for um, walkability, increased density, ground level activation, and parking interior to the site. I don't see any of those here. I have concerns that this is not the vision we had for the Aldrich connection. It's neither tree-lined nor particularly green, and it's not a street, it's a parking aisle. Yeah, I don't like the proximity to the streets. I wanna see something that's next to the streets. I believe that was the intent of the retrofit plan, and I don't like the low density I'm seeing. Okay, all right. All right, uh, commission members, I think um, we're finding ourselves in a position here of there's some um, maybe approval of the where the grocery store is, but I'm hearing in general that the preliminary plan is not necessarily 
the best plan across the board uh, for the most part. Um, Commissioner Abdi, I think you mentioned uh, the corner, you know, maybe that could be redeveloped in your own right, thinking about that. Um, and again, I think we're holding this up as the Lindale retrofit plan and thinking about what were the primary tenants of that. The walkability, uh, as you mentioned, Commissioner Cook done, the uh, street level activation, which you got to say, the only, there's one less than one quarter of this that does that. Um, and uh, I think overall the proximity to what we think will be a very successful uh, transit development, um, that this should be providing those tenants all the way through the, the development, if I'm uh, reading the, the commission right. So... Um, with that, would anybody like to make a motion? And I fully expect we, well, there's five of us, so there will be one motion uh, one way or the other compared to when we've had an even number. Um, commission members? Now, keep in mind, um, again, the planned, uh, there we go, the planned development zoning overlay allows for planned development. That's one thing. Um, but the second one, I think, is where I hear uh, the most division uh, amongst um, the commission here tonight regarding the preliminary and final development plan. So uh, craft your um, motion accordingly. Uh, Commissioner Cookton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a point of clarification. The required findings I'm seeing in the staff report relate mostly to motion number two. Are there required findings for the first motion or what is our determination criteria for that? Uh, Mr. Commissioner Cook, there are no specific findings for uh, rezoning, uh, rezonings. Um, so they're, you know, generally speaking with rezoning, we're, we're thinking about uh, what sort of development uh, we wish to see uh, within a particular area. Um, this particular rezoning request allows for a planned development to be established, uh, is not uh, approving any specific form uh, for that development. Uh, that's really uh, the focus of the second motion. And if we were to, in council were to ultimately approve the first motion but not the second, that would be a effectively a permanent rezone of that site. Okay. Any other questions or comments yet? Uh, Commissioner Goldsman, it looks like you're trying to touch the microphone, but weren't sure. I haven't decided yet. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, a question for the second um, motion. So just to clarify, if we were to approve, it's both for the grocery and the, and the future development, which we kind of don't have the details for yet. But it would be approving it if we approved it as it's written today. Mr. Commissioner, that, that's correct. Yeah, you're, you're being asked to, to make a recommendation on the preliminary development plan. Uh, the commissioners have, have had comments on uh, some elements that could be improved with that plan, mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately you are being asked to uh, make a recommendation on, on what's presented to you. Great, thank you. Okay. Commissioner Roman? And I was just, well, feel free to have further conversation. I'm, okay. I'm comfortable with the first, um, advancing the first motion if anyone. Okay, commission members, uh, if I don't hear anything else, uh, entertain a motion. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Roman. Thank you. In case PL 2021-191, I move to recommend the City Council adopt an ordinance to apply the planned development zoning overlay to 9728 Lindale Avenue South. All right, Commission members, we have a motion in front of us. Is there a second? Second. Commissioner Abdi, thank you. All right, Commission members, we have a motion and a second in front of us to recommend the City Council adopt an ordinance to apply the planned development zoning overlay to 9728 Lindale Avenue South. Is there any further discussion? Not seeing any. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, motion passes. That will move on 
to the November 15th City Council meeting. All right, Commission members, we have another motion um, in front of us to, uh, at this point, uh, on our screens to recommend approval or um, we can go the other way. So, Commission members, or modify. Commissioner uh, Crookton. Mr. Chair, I'll take the first crack at a motion if there's okay. no further discussion. Uh, Mr. Chair, in case PL2021-191, having been unable to make the required findings, I move to recommend City Council deny preliminary and final development plans to partially redevelopment the Clover Center Shopping Center to accommodate an approximately 24,000 square foot grocery store, as well as establish future retail and mixed use development phases subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. All right, thank you, Commissioner Cookdown. Commission members, we have a motion in front of us to deny uh, the uh, recommend denial of the preliminary and final development plans. Is there a second? Second. All right, Commission members, we have a motion and a second in front of us to <clears throat> having not been able to make the required findings to move uh, that the City Council deny preliminary and final development plans to partially redevelop the Clover Center Shopping Center to accommodate an approximately 24,000 square foot grocery store as well as establish future retail mixed use development phases subject to the conditions and code. Uh, I guess we don't need to necessarily add, add that, but I will repeat it since you said it. Uh, conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. All right, uh, commission members, again, in front of us, we uh, have a motion. Any further discussion? Not seeing any. All those in favor of recommending denial to the City Council say aye. 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 All those uh, against, same Nay. sign? Nay. All right. So that will move forward to the City Council uh, with a re uh, recommendation of denial with a vote of three to one. Four to one. Four to one. I can count. <laughs> I promise. All right, uh, Commission members, that uh, uh, concludes item number one in front of us tonight. That will again move forward to the November 15th City Council meeting as a public hearing. All right, moving on to item number two. And um, I see that uh, we have a uh, request to continue that by the applicant to the October 28th, 2021 Planning Commission meeting. Uh, Planning Commission members, I would entertain a motion uh, to continue uh, item number two uh, to the October 28th, 2021 Planning Commission me meeting. Commissioner Goldsman. Uh, motion to continue case PL2021-192 to the October 20th, 28th Planning Commission meeting. All right, thank you. Is there, uh, members, we have a motion in front of us to continue. Uh, item number two to the October 28th Planning Commission meeting. Is there a second? Second. All right. Commission members, we have a motion and a second in front of us to continue uh, the City Code Amendment High Density Auto Sales to the October 28th, uh, 2021 Planning Commission meeting. Is there any further discussion? Not seeing any. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Motion carries. That item will uh, move forward to the October 28th uh, Planning Commission meeting. All right, uh, next item is a change of condition uh, request by Nine Mile Brewing. M Mr. Johnson, staff report, please. Thank you, Chair Solberg, and uh, good evening, commissioners. Uh, this is a conditional use permit that was before you not so long ago, uh, just in June. So it should be fairly fresh in your memory. And in fact, I think there was some discussion about uh, the sidewalk connection in question uh, for tonight's uh, change of condition application at that meeting. So we'll uh, I'll provide some slides for you and hopefully not uh, confuse you. <laughs> South Tech uh, number two, South Tech Plaza is located at James and 96th. So again, you're familiar with the site. This is just north of City Hall. This is the building uh, in an oblique view and the uh, subject tenant space is highlighted in yellow. Uh, the tap room, brewery, and restaurant is currently under construction. Uh, the last I heard, I believe they're targeting an opening uh, period of late November, early December. Um, so that's the last information that I had on it. Um, what's before you this evening is that, uh, as with any conditional use uh, permit, uh, either the planning commission or the city council has the authority and ability to add conditions of approval. 
on the basis of city code requirements, but also um, some discretionary level on the basis of public health, safety, and welfare. Um, as part of that conditional use permit approval uh, in June, uh, there was condition number eight, which stated that uh, prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, that a sidewalk be provided to link the primary entrance uh, of the tap room uh, with the public sidewalk network. There's public sidewalks uh, in this area along West 96th Street, um, as well as uh, James Avenue. So that's, that's what uh, informed uh, condition number eight. Um, just, to, just to have a quick discussion about uh, code trigger uh, versus discretionary uh, actions on the part of a decision-making body. Um, the, there is, as we, on your last item, you're talking a lot about nonconformity. Um, not having a sidewalk connection to a building is what's considered a nonconforming site characteristic. There's actually specific triggers in code of when you have to provide that by code, whereas it's not a discretionary action, but rather it just has to happen. Um, one of those examples would be a full redevelopment or the expansion of a building by uh, more than 25%, say. Um, those are a couple examples. In this case, this was more of a discretionary uh, condition that was added on the basis of a, a life safety uh, welfare discussion. We can talk about the surrounding uses of this uh, of this um, uh, proposed tap room and restaurant, um, but suffice to say, on the, based on the professional judgment of staff, uh, compared to the former occupancy of this space, which was office and warehouse, uh, a brewery tap room and uh, restaurant is going to generate an increased level of pedestrian and bicycle traffic uh, by comparison. Now, where that line exists, how to quantify that, um, there's less data in, say, an Institute of Transportation Engineers uh, or studies or research out there that actually uh, nails down number of trips by use. It's very much variable on a, a number of different circumstances, not only urban versus suburban, but different parts of the country have seasonal effects as far as pedestrians and bicycles and all sorts of things. Culture of a local community, Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, metro areas, famously uh, very high bicycle uh, use. Um, so many of those things can play a factor as to why we don't have as solid of data as far as automobile uh, trips. So suffice to say that in the professional judgment of staff, um, the, what informed that recommendation at that time is that uh, the proposed uh, use compared to the old use was going to generate increased uh, traffic in pedestrian and bikes. Um, as part of, uh, and I'll get to the reasons why the applicant has made this request, but as part of uh, the analysis of trying to execute that, uh, the applicant ran into a number of difficulties in providing that di direct uh, connection link, and we'll get into more detail. Just again, setting the context as to why um, staff is, uh, you know, fairly uh, confident or um, believes that there will be increased pedestrian traffic to this use. Um, this is just gives you a flavor of some of the surrounding uses in the area. You have uh, not only a lot of jobs uh, within a half a mile of this, um, of this uh, tap room and restaurant, uh, but you also have residential, which certainly has the potential to have either a daytime, daytime or nighttime. Uh, use uh, characteristic. You also have Civic Plaza, which of course includes the Fine Arts Center, which has certainly a number of plays either before or after activities. Um, uh, and then, um, yeah, and then you have uh, certainly uh, large employers like Donaldson where you could have uh, large happy hour or other type activities. So um, we're fairly confident that the, the pedestrian and bicycle traffic to this site is going to increase uh, on the basis of some of the surrounding uses. The challenge that the applicant encountered, uh, and staff certainly is supportive and concurs with the applicant's analysis, is that there's quite a bit of grade uh, right in this location of the site. Um, unfortunately, uh, the area that would be the most logical pedestrian connection uh, to West 96th Street uh, to the tap room itself uh, would not likely meet both the vertical and cross slope requirements uh, for the American uh, Disabilities Act, ADA. So uh, in order to provide an ADA uh, compliant connection, you would either have to do switchbacks uh, along the roadway or do some very significant and disruptive grading to the site to kind of regrade this whole area to flatten and level it out. Uh, so it'd be a very costly uh, intervention. Uh, and, and as with anything with land use law, there always has to be a nexus of kind of what you're requiring uh, the property owner to do uh, to, what, uh, to what is uh, being required of them. Um, in this case, just the occupancy, not building new buildings, but just creating an occupancy. 
So um, either by creating a sidewalk connection at this island, which kind of shown to you in this left image, and these are exhibits from the applicant's materials, um, that would not meet the ADA requirements. If they pushed it further to the uh, west, you would also have to disrupt a private retaining wall. Um, and again, have, doing a, a direct connection like being shown in the yellow lines there uh, also likely would not comply with ADA requirements because of the, the slope uh, that's being shown there. That's often where you see some of these switchback type sidewalk uh, scenarios. So it, it's a challenging uh, scenario and uh, staff uh, concedes or concurs, is in full agreement with the applicant that that uh, ultimately uh, is probably not the best solution here. Um, so what is the best solution? We've had a lot of discussion with the applicant, and I credit the applicant. I actually thank the applicant for being very uh, willing to have a multitude of meetings, both on-site and uh, in uh, virtual form, of course, in 2021, uh, to discuss what the different options are. Um, the, the property owner ultimately submitted a uh, change of condition application to remove the condition altogether. Um, you know, in further discussion upon receipt of that application, Staff did identify some uh, sidewalk connection alternatives, which you can see here on this slide as kind of being shown in the green uh, option, what is labeled as option three, and we'll talk about what the different options mean. Um, but uh, this, this solution, while it is uh, a shorter connection, while it is a much uh, flatter area within the site, it's not without its own warts. It's, you know, it's a very long distance away uh, from the Nine Mile Brewing uh, occupancy. So um, this is a scenario where uh, there's no easy or clear, uh, you know, conclusion to be reached. And so with that, uh, we've kind of come up with uh, different alternatives and options uh, kind of for your consideration along with the recommendation. Um, following the identifying, uh, before I kind of throw out what the options are, just getting to the, the final conclusion of our work with the applicant, we met with the applicant on, or we sp spoke with the applicant on October the 7th, uh, where we proposed kind of a final alternative, a proposal where uh, we could kind of revisit this issue after the, the tap room opened. Because I think one of the points of question is what is the level of pedestrian and bicycle uh, uh, trips that are going to be generated by this use? Right now we have anecdotal, we have what our training suggests, we have what most people assume to be true as far as a tap room uh, and restaurant is concerned but we don't have any data to operate off of. And so in order to uh, kind of answer that final question, and this is an approach upon with meeting with the applicant who is on the call and certainly can speak to your questions if you have any, um, but in order to address that very question, staff proposed to him uh, a little bit of an innovative uh, solution in this case, and it would be similar to a proof of parking uh, type solution, whereas uh, it'd be a proof of uh, sidewalk connection solution. Whereas uh, the applicant, similar to a proof of parking, would enter into an agreement with the city. They would record it against the property. And uh, ultimately what it would seek to establish is what are some of these triggers or thresholds of pedestrian and bicycle activity that this use would generate that upon a review of this use 18 months down the road uh, would call for uh, the creation of a sidewalk connection into the site. And so really what it's creating is a, a pathway uh, to revisit this uh, with 18 months of data and, you know, six months, uh, well, probably more like nine months of that data is going to be spring or summer uh, type time where you're going to have more uh, theoretically more pedestrian uh, and bicycle activity. And so ultimately, as staff and the applicant were kind of discussing this idea, it became more and more uh, in, uh, in concert that this would be uh, kind of the best solution to get everyone on the same page and get over the hump. Um, so that's ultimately what, what we, uh, where we arrived. Um, uh, the applicant is supportive of that approach, from my understanding. Um, just in getting to the, the staff report laid it out as options, so I will briefly dis just describe that to you. Option one is the status quo. It's you have to provide a connection to the, the front door uh, to, the, to the sidewalk connection, uh, which we think is uh, challenging from a construction uh, standpoint. That's what's kind of shown in, in red on that exhibit there. Um, option two would be to strike the condition uh, altogether, which for the reasons I've stated, uh, increased pedestrian and bicycle activity associated with this use is also, uh, you know, has some warts or is not ideal. Uh, this third option uh, gets us to this uh, proof of uh, sidewalk connection idea uh, where we can revisit this uh, at a later date after collecting uh, enough data to make a more informed decision. Um, and I think the, the property owner was uh, more supportive of that approach. 
Um, just getting to the agreement itself, I already kind of discussed some of these bullet points, so maybe I won't um, uh, go too long on this, but uh, idea of uh, adopting it prior to January 31st, um, again, as I said, establishes uh, thresholds that are agreed upon by both city staff and the property owner. Uh, revisiting the situation in 18 months following uh, the opening of the tap room. And uh, as I said, the applicant has provided verbal support of this in our prior uh, meetings and correspondence. So that is what is uh, informing the staff recommendation in this case. So I'm happy to take any questions. Um, the, the motion before you provides uh, revised uh, condition language. Do note that it does change the timing of it from prior to C of O to ongoing, uh, just given the, the nuts and bolts of it. And this is what's reflected in the resolution uh, that was included in your packet. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Commissioner Abdi. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, to, uh, can you go back to your previous slide, please? Uh, no, the one after, the, yeah. Um, for bullet point three, um, who would be the one to do the analysis after some time? Like, would it be staff, the applicant self-reporting, or would it be a, you know, like some of the developments you see is a t t traffic analysis or who would actually do that to, for staff to re-examine uh, the condition? Yep, uh, Chair, Commissioner Abdi. So uh, we do have uh, a couple methods uh, the traffic staff does to collect this type of data. So more than likely it would be the city uh, doing the data collection. We certainly would include the, the property owner in those efforts and make sure that they're comfortable and understand what the methodology is. Um, again, as I said, we want to work hand in hand with him uh, through this process. So certainly that'll be part of uh, drafting that agreement. But um, from my perspective, it would be our city's traffic staff who would be collecting that data. All right. Any further questions for staff? Uh, Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, sorry, Mr. Johnson, on, uh, should I come back to this one? And on the previous slide, uh, the option one alternate, the one that's the furthest east, uh, that alternate, we believe, would meet uh, grade standards. It looks like, from what I can see from from a map, that that does, but that doesn't have the same grade issues as the initial connection. Is that accurate? Uh, Chair Commissioner Roman, option one, as it's currently being shown, likely would not meet ADA requirements. The um, uh, option there's there, there's two option one alternatives, right? Either one. Would not would not meet it. You'd have to do some significant grading or create a switchback sidewalk. Um, Even on the one that's 96. all the way to the east. I believe that's correct. And the one to the east is more of a cross slope issue because the driveway is pitched. Okay. Um, ADA only allows a two percent uh, cross slope, is my understanding. That's correct. Yeah. So um, <laughs> either solution, you're probably uh, you're either creating a switchback in the west, the left hand hand one you're doing some type of switchback sidewalk on the right hand or lifting, raising up the site somehow. Mm -hmm. um, on the right hand, on the eastern solution, you're probably doing some significant grading and repaving okay. um, to flatten all that out. And okay. uh, given the grades, it's it's a lot of intervention. Sure. So then where you're showing option three, is there a reason that the, the connection, if, if that was what you had to pursue, doesn't happen farther west where there's already a stub that, where that crosses the, the free right there? Yeah, the, the thank you that, for that question. The reason being is that uh, the one that's being shown, just from doing the site visit, that's the easiest, less disruptive connection. It's the flattest area. It wouldn't require the removal of any trees. You know, potentially root systems could be uh, slightly disturbed, but um, there's also a, uh, a parking stall there um, that, that kind of is a little bit narrow on the front end. Um, so our thought being there that that's the best candidate to stripe as a no parking condition for the pedestrians to access the drive aisle. Okay. I was just thinking about it from, uh, we talked about earlier, the, the cow path, if you will. Where yep. do where people go versus where do we think they should go? Those are not always the same. Yep. Uh, and my last question is on the next slide, I'm curious about, um, it's actually the same bullet point that Commissioner Abdi was asking about, yeah, can you explain to me why bicycle trips are a part of a factor in a sidewalk? Yeah, that, that's a fair question. I, I don't know if um, <laughs> some some bicyclists uh, use sidewalks. Um, not all bicyclists. It would be per preferred, I think, if they uh, did not use sidewalks. It'd also be preferred if all drivers respected and observed of bicyclists. <laughs> um, but I, I think the the purpose by just including 
bicycle is that we just want to capture all the forms of alternative uh, mode of transportation that people are utilizing to visit the site. We want to be able to capture what are the increases. Um, if there is a, a pretty resounding uh, data point of evidence that um, it's increased significantly, I think it just provides more um, urgency or emphasis to provide a connection into the site that's not the drive aisle um, right at it. But every bicyclist different. Myself, I would be comfortable utilizing a driveway, um, but I'm also recognized that other people are less comfortable uh, being in mixed traffic. Thank you. Yep. Other commission members? Commissioner Cookton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Johnson, um, when we talk about ADA, often that's a, a requirement. Uh, it's, it's not an option. Uh, but you mentioned this as sort of a discretionary condition on the original application. Can you just talk a little bit more about why this is optional or discretionary and not this is ADA code, you have to meet it? Yeah, so uh, Chair Commissioner Cookton, there's kind of two different things. One is the design. ADA is now the standard of design. Um, the, it's not, uh, well, I want to be careful that I don't do this in, incorrectly. Getting back to your first discussion point, there's going to be a development from all areas of development in the city, 70s, 80s, 90s, that were, did not meet the current standard. The question then becomes is at what point, at what type of development activity, whether it just be an occupancy in this case or an addition in another case or a, uh, an, a full redevelopment in other cases, at what point consistent with state law, can we uh, establish thresholds that now your site has to come into conformance with these requirements? So the reason why I mentioned that it was discretionary in this case is because it did not trigger the classic uh, touch points in the sidewalk and nonconformity ordinance that are identified in city code. However, that being said, there is a discretionary allowance uh, to include conditions on the basis of public health, safety, welfare. Um, so that's what it would have fallen under. Um, does that answer the question in a roundabout way? Uh, it does, and just so, so to clarify that, if this was a new building, this would be a requirement, not at anybody's discretion. That's correct, and the, the grading plan for the building would take into account of how are you going to provide an ADA sidewalk connection, Thank compliant you. sidewalk connection. Okay. Other Commissioner Goldsman? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, can we go back to the over um, the, the map? Yeah, oh, the, actually go back. That one right there. So one of the things that I have question on is I know that there will be outdoor patios on both corners. So can you give us an overview of how those patios would be laid out in relation to these, um, these paths or sidewalks? I'm going to do it, uh, yes, Chair Commissioner Goldsman, I'm going to do it uh, rudimentary, rudiment, in a Perfect. rudimentary way. <laughs> it's all my um, but uh, there's a south patio that's approximately kind of in this location. Mm -hmm. And there's an east one, which was proposed approximately in this location. So, um, you know, both of them are very close and accessible to the building. They both have their own uh, specific entrances and would allow for egress within that within the patio too. Uh, that's allowed. Um, but the, you know, they're they're in uh, close proximity to the front door, both of them. Okay. Thank you. Yep. They can extend out into the drive aisle, so they shouldn't disrupt vehicle or theoretically pedestrian or bicycle traffic um, that would be uh, navigating the parking lot. Okay. Go ahead, Commissioner Goldsman. So for the the path that is on in my screen on the right-hand side, I think that's the east mm -hmm. side. So just to understand, um, there would be a walkway to a parking stall, but really there's no um, path from that that walkway to the front door, or would they have to block out all of those parking spots? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question, uh, Chair Commissioner Goldsman. Th they would have the opportunity to add sidewalk. Um, currently, the island is nonconforming. Um, you know, ideally, we would have a street tree within that island. But if you not, if you striped off uh, another stall as no parking, you you couldn't create some sidewalk or uh, pedestrian way uh, to the front door. More than likely, I can't recall offhand uh, how much landscaping is in that immediate area and what's planned mm -hmm. uh, for the site. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is a scenario that um, 
given all the constraints, I, back to what I said, I think no condi- no condition is ideal. It's probably an improvement, but uh, it's not going to be ADA compliant um, mm-hmm. and would require uh, significant disruption to be so. Commissioner Cookton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Johnson, I know that was a highly architectural sketch you drew there. But Thank you. To <laughs> clarify the western patio there. Would that be to the west of that walking aisle to the front door? That's correct. Okay. So yep. there would be a straight path there. You'd walk on the right side of the patio. Yep. I have the privileged position of being a reviewer and not a designer on most of the things <laughs> I work on. <laughs> Any further comments for staff on this from commission members? All right, not seeing any. Um, Mr. Markergaard is the applicant on, and would you like to speak? Yeah, Mr. Chair, Mr. Uh, Steve Hoyt is here, and Mr. Hoyt, uh, you're able to speak at this point. Looks like he's on the phone. Um, I will unmute you, Mr. Hoyt. Just warning you. Are you there, Mr. Hoyt? There we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we sure can. Great. Um, yeah, we, um, uh, you know, when I look at this uh, um, uh, brew pub, the uh, couple things jump out at me. Um, one is that there's a lot of parking, and we we uh, located this this uh, tenant at the at the end cap so we can take advantage of uh, all the parking on the end cap which extends into the the uh, the the u-shaped area um, and, of, and of course we we uh, also have enhanced the lighting at a significant expense to make sure that we've got a safety uh, that our safety issue is covered the uh, the other thing that i that i think is obvious is that uh, people probably aren't going to be day drinking, and they're um, uh, at least I hope not. <laughs> and I think they'll probably use this uh, after working hours, or after four thirty or five o'clock. And there's plenty of parking available. I would I would say that, um, uh, in my opinion, that judging from my visit to the um, to the Broken Hill. Uh, Brew Pub, which is a very similar situation in the Edina Industrial Park, mm-hmm. uh, ex- except that that building doesn't have a lot of parking, and the uh, and the um, uh, and the and the pub is actually located in the middle of the building. Um, I think that uh, I think that there probably won't be a lot of bicycle traffic. Um, I, I think, generally speaking, people people don't drink a lot of beers and and uh, and ride their bike home. And and also, I I don't I don't think there's going to be a lot of pedestrian traffic coming in here. I think it's going to be car traffic, and you know that's why we have handicapped spots in front of the building, so that people uh, can come in if they're handicapped, if they have a wheelchair. Um, it's really easy for them to get in. I this this isn't this isn't a cost issue to us. This is a public safety issue to us. We don't. We don't think it's the right thing to do to deposit people, pedestrians or people in wheelchairs or bicycles uh, in a heavily trafficked area by cars and trucks, uh, especially during the winter months or, or, or inclement weather months. We just we, we just don't think it's the right thing to do. And and uh, and I and I think I think that people have. Um, uh, pl- plenty of great ways to get to the brewery, and you know, even if they're not walking on a sidewalk, they can walk three feet away. They can walk on a uh, on an asphalt paved uh, uh, driveway. So, I, I, you know, to me, it's a non-issue. But I think that um, we, I guess, we don't know, and we'll see. And you know, maybe twelve months, eighteen months from now, we. Uh, we uh, take a look at it, and we've got the city's data, and we uh, and we say that there should be a sidewalk connection. But for right now, I think it. Uh, uh, I just, I just, I just don't think it's the right thing to do. 
All right, thank you, Mr. Hoyt. Uh, Commission members, anything for Mr. Hoyt? Not seeing any. Thank you, Mr. Hoyt, for uh, uh, being with us tonight. We have uh, no additional questions for you. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. All right, uh, at this time, we'll go ahead and open up the public hearing um, on this particular subject. And again, uh, Mr. Markergaard, uh, if you can check if there's anybody online, nobody in the chambers at this point, so... Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, looking at the WebEx, we have no uh, callers on the WebEx. And the intercall, they reset the server. So checking in there, we also have no callers on intercall. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, commission members, with that, I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Commissioner Goldsman. Motion to close the public hearing. All right, we have a motion in front of us to close the public hearing. Is there a second? Second. All right, and a second by Commissioner Cook then. All right, uh, com committee, commission members, we have a motion and a second in front of us to close the public hearing. Uh, any further discussion? Not seeing any. All those in favor say aye. 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 Public hearing is now closed on this particular matter. All right, commission members, any uh, discussion on this uh, request in front of us to revise condition number eight? Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Thank you to the staff for thinking creatively with the applicant about how to look at this. I think this concept of proof of connectivity, I, is, uh, I appreciate that people have thought outside the box. And if anyone here, I'm usually the one who says sidewalk, sidewalk, sidewalk. Um, and we, I think at the time we reviewed this application back in June, we kind of questioned <laughs> what this was this stub into a parking lot. So, um, cause I don't find, you know, even option three to be all that compelling. So, and given that it's that not that far around the end to, to walk on in the drive aisle, which you're going to have to walk in the drive aisle on any of those options. Um, my only recommendation, and I don't know how others feel is I would not be, uh, in support of including bicycles in that count. Um, I, I understand that bicycles do like to use the sidewalk. I don't believe it's the right thing and we shouldn't encourage it. So using that in an account that triggers, um, a requirement for a sidewalk connection I would not be supportive of. Other than that, I'm you know, happy to bike there someday and day drink, I guess, since it was the things <laughs> that the, the gentleman was unsure if we would have. And uh, you know, let's keep our options open. Thank you, Commissioner Roman. Any other commissioners? Commissioner Goldsman. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I will echo Commissioner Roman's comment on being creative. I love that we have... You know, proof of parking is a constant, and so let's do proof of si of sidewalk. I think it makes really a lot of sense. Um, just something that kind of I'm a little bit apprehensive about is the concept of establishing a threshold, um, because today it is not a walkable neighborhood. I, I was was actually employed across the street from where this brewery will be for many years, and really isn't a lot of things to walk to and so this will uh, will generate more walking traffic so I think one thing we'll we'll need to talk through or maybe just to understand is when we say set a threshold what what does that mean does it just mean it's increasing well it's going to increase or is it in increasing by x percent and if it's zero then x percent is a lot right um so i just want to make sure that we're mindful of what that that threshold means um the only other thing i have a comment on is you know looking at the parking lot in general if we could pull up the overhead again is there plans to do just striping um so i understand putting a sidewalk in isn't you know realistic at least without having good data but would it make sense to put some more striping in, in place, just painted um, to just direct the flow of those pedestrians without putting a, a, a sidewalk in? Is that is that something that could be done or maybe just a comment? Um, and I know we've got public comment and, and questions are done. So just two things that I look at, but I think overall having this proof of sidewalk connection makes a lot of sense. Um, but we just need to make sure we have the, the right thresholds and measurements in place. All right. Uh, Commissioner Cookton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Johnson, is this a final decision-making authority for the Planning Commission? Uh, Chair Commissioner Cookton, that's correct. 
So I think I would encourage this body to Commissioner Goldsmith's point. If we're the if we're the last stop on the road here, we maybe should consider some some metric or some threshold. Um, my comments, however, are a bit uh, of a departure from that. Um, I, I've talked more than once on this commission that we are the body of practicality, that uh, we look at every item that comes before us as in its own application, and uh, we are the closest thing to the streets, and we can see when a um, deviation is, is practical. And so um, you might expect I would be in favor of this, but I'm, I'm actually not. I, I see this as um, a plight that was brought on by choosing this site. Um, this is not a, uh, you know, this is not like a funky shaped lot or something that the applicant didn't have control on. This is the site they chose. And um, this was the condition of approval that we gave to them. And that's what, that's what they've run with. And that's, you know, that's, that's the situation that, that they're in now. And I, I don't think I'm inclined to, to change it. Um, you know, I, I work professionally in, a, in the design world, and it's uh, not uncommon for us to have to go to great lengths to achieve ADA. And we do it, and I'm not accusing the owner of not doing it, but we do it because it's the right thing to do. And uh, we, we care about the folks that are in our building, and if it costs us a ton of money or a lot of time or a lot of effort on the design team, we, we meet ADA, and we've, we've gone a long ways to do that in my line professionally, and I think we could do it here. And even if it's only three people in a wheelchair a year, that would be utilizing this ramp. For me, that's worth it to be a city that's uh, accommodating to those folks. And so, again, I want to stress, I don't think the applicant is you know, trying to buck ADA or something like that. But in my opinion, this is the site they bought. This is the site they chose. This is the condition that's on the application. And although it's costly, um, I'm not inclined to change that decision. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Cookton. Anybody else from the Planning Commission with any comments? Or I'll uh, maybe throw in a couple things here. Um, so I m remember when we, we approved this, and I went out to the site, and I was like, there is no way that we're going to be able to make ADA uh, compliant to the front door um from the sidewalk that's immediately in front of it there i mean there would be but it you would be uh substantial involvement uh, uh changing that uh landscape yard and everything in front to considerable expense much to your your point commissioner cook um ada can be achieved uh if you try but there is a reasonable extent uh uh level that's within ADA as well. Um, I think here, in my mind, um, it makes sense to make the connection to the property. I, I'm not sure that it makes sense to make it to the front door. Um, I do appreciate the staff being kind of innovative in this and, and allowing an opportunity to, to, for the, the business to show that there is not any pedestrian activity. I personally believe that there will be. Um, I think uh, maybe even to our staff's own uh, slip that they uh, mentioned during the during the presentation that it will drive more activity. One of the things I struggle with um, in this particular uh, item is just what makes sense, right? Um, we we tend to I think use a lot of that in this uh, planning commission to try and drive what makes sense in the process the uh right now the sidewalk to the east stops so uh if we had a full sidewalk uh going to the east i'd say maybe there should be one um, from that direction uh, we do have of course humboldt avenue to the south um, but that doesn't have sidewalk either um and then really you think about okay well coming down on james avenue uh, there is a sidewalk, but there is no ADA compliant uh, sidewalk connection to anywhere in South Tech Plaza. Um, but the the of course what we expect maybe a pedestrian um, destination is of course uh, Nine Mile Brewing. So uh, and you look at again back to where some of the residential are and some of that. I I, 
I do think that that southeast corner probably makes a lot of sense. Um, and I'm willing to to go with this idea that they show that there's pedestrian uh, activity. Um, bicycle, I, I can go back and forth. We, I don't believe we have an ordinance that says you can't ride bicycles on the sidewalk in Bloomington. I know that exists in some locations. Um, but from that standpoint, I, I just, I think uh, Mr. Hoyt's just going to have to bite the bullet in 18 months and put in the sidewalk connection. Um, because I, to the point, you get people uh, that can't walk um, uh, down some of these slopes. They're mobility impaired in some form or fashion. They're not all going to drive. I, and quite honestly, I'd rather have people walk than drive after going to the brewery. So um, from that standpoint, I can support the amendment um, or the change uh, for, for the applicant here, um, but fully realizing in some ways I almost think that we should just require it and it has to be to the property, not to the front door. Because again, I think everything on the property from that connection is probably ADA compliant. As a, as a private entity, they have their own responsibility that's outside of the public entity's responsibility. So I know that was long-winded. I apologize. Um, any other comments from commission members? Just a clarification. I concur ahead, with everything you said, and I would be in support of moving this uh, proposal forward, actually. Um, for s facilities like these that are non-conforming to some extent to... ADA requirements based on what Mr. Johnson described in terms of like the different levels of ADA requirement, whether it's existing, new, or refurbishing. Um, is In this case, would it be, I know that Mr. Hoyt is a tenant, or did he buy the the chunk of space that he's operating in? He's the property owner. Oh, he is the, pro okay. Yep. All right, perfect. I, I don't, that was my question. All right, commission members, uh, Commissioner Cookton. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'm a little torn internally whether I should offer a happy medium because on some, in some ways I think it's either ADA or not ADA. And so I'm a little torn, but I can count noses as well as anybody. Um, so I think I'll offer up a, perhaps a middle ground. Can you go back, Mr. Johnson, to the site plan or any type of overhead view? That's fine. For those who can walk and are going to use the sidewalk system, I still don't like the egress and access of this mm. and when in from the health, safety, welfare checkpoint. And although I wish it was fully ADA compliant, I don't think I'm going to win out on that. But I don't like people having to walk over to the drive aisle to walk out because I that's high traffic and a little higher speed and people are plugging something into their GPS or haven't put their phone away yet. I'd like to see a safer way for people to get out of here. I'd like other commissioners' thoughts if they'd be willing to put in a stair uh, up that grade there to the sidewalk that provides access to the front door. Uh, Commissioner Goldsman? I, I actually like that idea. I think that um, it does allow for access. A stair, it, it's not ideal, but it seems practical. Um, the only thing I think about stairs is in the winter and obviously slipping and, and um, falling, but I, I think it, it, it might be an interesting compromise um, for lots. Now, it doesn't fix the bike because uh, going down stairs on a bike might not be so great, but it's an interesting idea. Uh, uh, go ahead, uh, Commissioner Rome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had a similar thought earlier, but then I presume that a stair would be a connection that would be non-compliant, and I, I don't know enough about the code. I know enough to be dangerous, which is not good. Um, so would a, would a stair be acceptable, or would we have just created a connection that's non-compliant? Yeah, let's uh, see if staff has some thoughts on that. Um, if you're creating a new non-compliant connection. Because <laughs> again, I, I like the idea too. I had thought about it earlier. And I just assumed it was not an acceptable approach. Um, 
Yes, is Miss uh, Miss Long? Uh, would you like to maybe throw in on this or give us some thoughts? Sure. Um, I think once upon a time up at Lindale and 84th in front of the Cub and I can't remember the name of the private development. They did build a stair um, in f- to make that connection. If you go out there now, that staircase has been removed. So I think that is the precedent that we would be following, that while a stair is a nice connection, it doesn't meet the mobility needs of all the users, and so it was removed, and so I think we should follow that example. All right. Appreciate that uh, um, good guidance. Go ahead, Commissioner Roman. Ms. Long, do we know, was it removed uh, by the property owners because it wasn't being used or it didn't want to be maintained, or was it removed at the city's direction? I actually don't know that. It's totally fine. Sorry. Uh, Just another question, and I know you probably may not know this, or maybe we don't have it on the graphic, uh, only because I know um, enough to be dangerous, but where is the property line on this parcel? Because I do know the owner of the property is responsible for ADA compliance. So if it's city versus um, private, uh, two different things, I suppose. Yeah, thanks, Chair. It's right, uh, the property line, according to GIS, which, you know, can be off by a foot or two, uh, but it appears that the property line is on the south side of the sidewalk. The sidewalk uh, in Bloomington is typically constructed within a sidewalk bikeway easement, which starts right uh, at the property line. All right. So I just, uh, again, creating an ADA compliance issue for the city is certainly not something we want to do. We certainly don't want to necessarily do it um, for landowners either by requiring something. Uh, that's non-compliant but I'm wondering if we could craft a um, it's it's tough because it has to be ADA compliant I I, I don't see uh, based on Miss Long's uh, good guidance why would you create something that people of all abilities can't use Commissioner Cookton Mr. Chair, I think you would do that because um, it's making it better. It's better than nothing. But if you require that, then I think at the very least you're going to have to require an ADA-compliant connection. Well, if you're going to support a full ADA ramp, you have my backing on that. You've started this mess, Commissioner Crypton. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I, yeah, you. I, I think you bring up a good point, though, and it's about usability of the property um, and, and getting customers to this of all abilities. Um, much like we don't want to put ADA compliance ramps in driveways, why would we want to put able-bodied people in driveways um, to the same uh, piece? And I understand your desire to, to want to do that. I just don't want to put the city in a, in a position of requiring a landowner um, to build something that doesn't meet federal ADA uh, compliance. And I don't know if our attorney is available tonight to throw any wisdom our way. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, two things. One, as we discussed new options, we would like to have the applicant have the Mm -hmm. ability to uh, weigh in on that. Mm And then second, we do have uh, Megan Rogers from our legal department on the WebEx. Okay. All right. I don't know. Uh, Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, One potential path forward may be um, to advance the proof of connectivity uh, and leave open the resolution of what that connectivity is should it be required that it would have to come back. I don't know if we want to do that or not, but rather than try to design on the fly, yep, right. one option That's would be to pursue or advance the proof of connectivity concept, and should the, the, the finding be made that connectivity needs to happen, uh, then either it comes back here or we can defer to the staff on their good judgment on that either mm-hmm. way. But um, rather than try to figure out the right solution, I think we either think there should be a solution now or we're open to the idea of assessing to see if there should be a solution. 
Those no, are that's kind of a two points. Very good point, Commissioner Roman. I think um, you're right. We're kind of jumping to the solution with these rather than allowing the analysis um, taken by the city, uh, right? Because what if, uh, and I'm, you can go through the scenarios that all these pedestrians um, walking and rolling and biking are coming from Humboldt, it wouldn't make much sense to put an ADA compliant ramp um, any other way or any other location. So it, is there enough flexibility, Mr. Johnson, in the um, current scenario or the current uh, language that uh, the connection is not so limited to number three? Yeah, thanks, Chair Solberg. Neither the condition itself or the resolution that you would be potentially adopting this evening uh, zeroes in on the solution. Okay. That would be achieved through uh, the, this agreement that the applicant would enter in with the city uh, in consultation with the city's traffic staff and planning staff and all the staff uh, that are involved in that type of decision making. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, commission members, is that uh, acceptable to you? Commissioner Cookton? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Johnson, would we would we know from this data collected um, how many folks are in a position that where they're wheelchairing or other means other than walking, or is it just somebody here was crossed the threshold? Yeah, Chairman, uh, Commissioner Cookton, uh, Julie or Kirk could probably answer that question better than I could, but my understanding is it does use video technology, uh, so it does probably provide the nature of the pedestrian trip, but... Uh, Commissioner Cookton, we have a video camera that we deploy to do our bike and ped, ped counts so we can see the different modes that people are using. So maybe, you know, we've got two scooters, 12 peds, three bikes, and one wheelchair. We'd be able to determine the different types. Thank you. That makes me a lot more comfortable. I sure would like to see this as a planning commissioner. Again, if they cross, cross whatever threshold, uh, I would certainly be interested in us having this discussion again because it's going to be a judgment call. Well, it was, was it six wheelchairs or nine wheelchairs or what's that threshold? And I think we should have that conversation as a planning commission because it's kind of a judgment thing. Mm. Okay. Um, uh, just ask here, Mr. Markegaard, uh, thoughts on what the what that would be, because I think as the current condition is written, that would just be a staff um, staff resolved issue. Yeah. yeah, Mr. Chair, that's correct. As it's written or as it's drafted, it would be a staff review. So that would need to be modified if you want it to come back to planning commission. Okay. And just to uh, just want to Commissioner Cook done thinking about this a little bit. Uh, if you uh, did want to modify uh, the condition in front of us, um, I guess the thought would be if there's a, after 18 months, you're essentially requesting them to come back. Uh, and I mean, with, I just trying to think about this through the, the city process, um, would that be a public hearing would that be how would that mr markegaard you got any thoughts yeah uh, mr chairman uh mr johnson could you advance to the condition i just want to see the the language as drafted and how we might refine that I suppose one option would be to insert where it says city staff and the applicant must meet and discuss the pedestrian connectivity requirements, just to add in the planning commission. Um, and it could say planning commission, city staff, and the applicant must meet and discuss pedestrian connectivity requirements um, at a planning commission meeting. Huh? Just throwing something out here. All right, Ed. Okay, I just trying to make sure we have an avenue um, moving forward. If that uh, was desired by the um, commission, I think I'm a little reluctant myself, uh, Commissioner Cookdown, to bring this back as a planning commission item. Um, from the standpoint that uh, one, we have staff that are well, very well versed in ADA, two, um, understanding 
that your desire is to understand uh, that people are making a connection to it, uh, to the property that's uh, convenient and safe. Um, I think staff has certainly heard that, and that's uh, certainly their desire as well. Um, but uh, if the commission so desires, Commissioner Crookton? Yeah, after hearing more about it, it's not a deal breaker for me. I, I think it's something staff could handle. Um, I think they've heard what we're trying to say there. If there's people in wheelchairs, we need to really focus on an ADA compliant ramp. Okay. Commissioner Abdi, do you have something? Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Just making sure. Commissioner Cookton? I'd like to make sure we've settled as a commission on the threshold piece. Is that something we are trying? Because kind of what we were just talking about, if there's no threshold now, after 18 months, uh, boy, it's it's hard to it's hard to have any teeth on what you want to do without a threshold. And it's it's tough for us to decide that tonight. But I get anxious about, well, we'll see you in 18 months and we'll talk about the rules and and the and the results at the same time. It'd be sure nice to have that with full clarity now. To establish clarity for staff to be able to and the applicant evaluate against. Yep. Okay. Any other thoughts, Commissioner Roman? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Did the staff have any initial thoughts on what that might be? Sure. Go ahead, Mr. Markegard or Ms. Long. Yeah. Or <laughs> or Mr. Roberts. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Kirk Roberts, Traffic and Transportation Engineer. So it seems reasonable to set the pedestrian levels as something related to the traffic that this site is supposed to generate. In other words, some percentage of vehicles that the traffic should generate. Uh, if we find that there's that percentage of pedestrians, then they need to go ahead and make those accommodations. And so the number would put out there is something between 8 to 20 pedestrians in an hour uh, would, would be about 5 to 10 percent of the trips that this site, the vehicular trips that this site is supposed to generate or protected to generate. So I'd use <clears throat> that as an opening criteria for a threshold. Can you say those numbers again, Mr. Right. So if Robert? the site were found to generate between eight to 20 bicyclists and pedestrians per hour. That would be our threshold. And the reason I throw the bikes in there is because I just want to make a couple of points on bicycle traffic. Uh, there is an ordinance in Bloomington that is very legal to ride your bicycle on sidewalks. Um, so that can be done. And you do need to yield to pedestrians and things like that. Um, and from experience, we know that there are a lot of people that actually do ride their bikes on the sidewalk, if not for the duration of their trip, for the end point of their trip. So if I'm riding my bicycle over to Starbucks to get some coffee there, I'll probably use the road or a bike lane or a path if that's available. But for that last part, I'm probably going to jump on the sidewalk to get over to Clover to to whatever that Starbucks is. And so I, I do think it's there's some merit to including that in. So I've just got to interject that too. Okay. If I could clarify, Mr. Roberts, is that per hour or peak hour or? That would be in any given hour. Any given hour. So Mr. Roberts, just to, so just to clarify, um, could, could you clarify it? how you would evaluate that so that would be an average over the 18 months that would be Mr. number chairman, of days in a month commissioners mr chairman commissioners i think it would just be during the sample time that, so in other okay. words we're not going to uh, station a camera out there for the next you know for a month or whatever we typically take that sample over a few days and how would evaluate that uh, is just if it were found in those in that period that we have the data being collected that that in a given hour you had uh, up eight to 20 pedestrian bicyclist trips that they would meet that threshold criteria and be asked to go ahead and make those accommodations and we would do it in a time when pedestrian activity is known so we're not going to go put those cameras out in the middle of february it would be over the summer months so just to clarify that too Okay, thank you. All right, commission members, I've just been advised on this as well. Um, if we continue to talk about this, we really should involve the applicant in the discussion. So um, it, just hearing maybe some of the conversation, I'm going to ask Mr. Hoyt uh, if he would comment. 
Um, <clears throat> sure, I'm online. Um, you know, I think that uh, people in wheelchairs. Uh, my observation is, and, and, I, and I've got a, um, and I've got a parent who uh, who's disabled um, and in a wheelchair. I think I think that they they don't they don't wheel um, for blocks and blocks and blocks. They usually come in a uh, in a van, and that's and that and that's why we have um, a handicap spot there. And I um, and I'm uh, um, I, I I I express to Londell and to Glenn that I'm willing to. This isn't a money issue for us. Uh, this is a public safety issue, and I'm willing to uh, go along with alternative number three, and and uh, deposit all those people. Uh, there won't be any, by the way, but but let's say there are. Deposit them into our parking lot, but but I'll do it um, only if the city says I have to do it, and I want it to be over the objection of the property owner because I think I think I think that there's an insurance issue here. I think there's a liability issue for dumping people into a parking lot from a from from the safety of a public sidewalk, the safety of a public sidewalk, if you dump them into a parking lot and force them to hypothetically take their wheelchair 400 feet, which is more than a football field, uh, through, through slush and snow, dodging trucks and other traffic, at the end of the day, when people are leaving their offices, I think uh, um, I think I think you create a liability issue, but if but if that's what you want to do, um, go ahead and mandate it. But I want it on the record that it's over the objection of the property owner because I don't want to get sued. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hoyt. Appreciate uh, your feedback to our question on that. Thank you. All right, um, commission members. Uh, we have an ongoing discussion with you. I think uh, pretty clear we heard Mr. Hoyt that um, this is really, uh, from his standpoint, this is more of an issue, a safety issue from his standpoint, not a uh, I won't, I can't do it, I can't accomplish it uh, scenario. So um, further thoughts? Commissioner Roman? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, like I said earlier, I think the question for me is, do we require a connection somewhere now, or are we open to this proof of connectivity? Um, and I guess for me, I am open to this uh, proof of connectivity as something to try. I think staff have laid out what their criteria are. Um, I hear their, their judgment about bicyclists. Um, again, bicyclists on the sidewalk isn't the deal breaker. It's the question is, are bicyclists gonna be the trigger for a connectivity? Uh, and that that's for me that's that's the the defining piece there um, because a bicyclist cutting through perhaps whether it's option three or option one at a substantial expense versus a bicyclist going around the corner through the driveway even if they came on the sidewalk again I'm trying to think of what's reasonable to trigger this for the applicant mm -hmm. so um, I'm supportive of pursuing the proof of connectivity thing I, again, I the, given those numbers Eight to twenty, it's it's a range. Um, I don't know how. Again, staff have ways that they determine eight to twenty. Is that a negotiation when, you know, it eight if we want to enforce eight, it's twenty if we don't want okay. to enforce twenty. So I don't know. Yeah. Um, interesting. You know, it, uh, thinking about that a little bit. If it's the connection for users. Uh, that we're talking about, um, and, and I'm trying to think of what what the premise is, why why we would require a connection, and it really is uh, again to provide a safe access into a facility, um, not necessarily the building, but the property, um, and so. Uh, while our ordinance talks about the building or the uh, the specific location, um, we found understand that that's not easily accommodated. So then we're kind of going back on this whole question. 
of if all the users are from Humboldt, why would you put something because it's easy to construct down um, on the opposite corner, right? Um, and if we're talking about safety, because we're doing it because of safety, um, or you're providing it an access, uh, you want to make sure it's for all users, right? Not just those that can walk. Um, and so it has to be, in my mind, an ADA. That's why ADA comes up, because you, you, you're making it for all users, because that's the federal law. Um, so the number, the threshold is, I, I, I get, I, I'm a little bit stuck on it, honestly, because what if that one user is a wheelchair user? It doesn't meet the threshold, so we don't get an ADA, a safe way for that user to enter the property. I'm stuck on this one. Um, so I hope it, others have good advice. Go ahead, uh, Commissioner Goldsman. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I think I, I wrote this down when they were talking about the threshold. So it was 8 to 10 um, pedestrians per hour, but it was actually a percentage of the number of trips. Did I write that down correctly? So we're actually looking at it from a percentage of how many cars, how many people, and what is the percentage. So I think that range just comes in from what they mm -hmm. expect and what the actual reality from their study would be a, a concrete number based on that percentage of total trips. Is that correct? Mr. Roberts? Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Goldsman, the, the number that I used was simply a percentage of the auto trips that are generated. And as we talked about earlier in the meeting here, we're not sure what that number is going to be. The, you know, we've heard that well, no one's going to show up there at all unless they're in a car. And I don't believe that's true. And it sounds to me the commission also believes that there's going to be some people walking and biking to the site. What that number is, though, is a little harder to get to. Yeah. And so what I proposed was merely just a percentage of the auto trips, um, just to start with a number there, and that's about 5 to 10% of the trips that we're going to get in the peak hour of this use. There's, um, It's expected to generate a certain percentage of trips, or a certain number of trips, excuse me, in its peak hour when it's really, really busy. Um, and... So the number I threw out was just a percentage of those in yeah. terms of the bikes and pedestrians. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. So I think based on what I'm hearing, I think there's a methodology of identifying who is coming to the brewery or this location uh, by walking, by bike, by scooter, however, but it's a methodology to understand the number of trips and percentages. Uh, but we don't know, right? So I, I, I think, in my mind, to move this forward, I, I really like the idea of let's see what it is, what the reality is, and then use this proof of connectivity to make the best educated decision on the reality of what what we're looking at. Since this is the first. So, the first establishment like this in the city, we, we don't have anything to go on. So, Commissioner Goldsman, are you suggesting that we would use uh, the percentage uh, users' uh, peak hour, as Mr. Roberts had, had mentioned? Because that would be an addition, then, I think, to I, this condition. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I think or we should guidance just, to them. We should just follow the staff's recommendations based on... Um, what we've what we've talked about, yeah. I think okay, so I, I, I just want to clarify because sure. right now um, that number is is not obligatory um, through the condition. That's something staff would decide on mm -hmm. as part of uh, the as you see here mm -hmm. between city staff and the applicant. Um, that would be the recommendation from them. I heard Commissioner Cookton say we should have a threshold. I want to make sure that we're we're all talking apples, mm. and apples not apples and oranges. Commissioner uh, Commissioner Roman first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think that yes, there should be a threshold. I think that yes, that can be. Um, the staff would I, I shouldn't assume, but I would presume 
that that would be part of the proof of connectivity agreement mm -hmm. that the city enters into with the property owner so that it's clear what the city is going to expect. It's clear what the property owner can expect. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Roman. Commissioner Cookdown, did you still have a comment? Uh, I was going to say exactly what Commissioner Roman just said. I'm supportive of a threshold, uh, but I'm okay with it being a percentage of trips. And I don't want to take our conversation backwards, but back to your point, um, the thing that makes me a little uncomfortable about a threshold is, you know, if we're 4%, and I don't want to play the 1% game, but if even if it is a, a very small percent, if I'm trying to put myself in the position of someone who is in a wheelchair, and I'm sitting at home going, what the heck? Just because there's not more people in a wheelchair, I don't get access? So yeah. that's what I struggle with. I see... Uh our uh, beloved Megan Rogers is online with us. Uh, uh, Ms. Rogers, would you like to uh, uh, impart your wisdom on the Planning Commission? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair and Commissioners, I think it might be helpful to talk a little bit more about sort of the origin of this particular condition, the, the sort of surrounding conversation about it, um, and how this proof of connectivity agreement can address the needs of both the city and the concerns that you've raised tonight um, as well as a property owner. So this item is before you because this type of use often generates pedestrian use. But as was previously mentioned, we don't have a similar facility in the city of Bloomington. Um, it's also located in an area where we don't have a residential component that's immediately walkable. Um, and it has you know, many of those industrial characteristics. And so while we believe that there will be um, a pedestrian element to this, it, that information is not before us um, based on sort of what's presented um, based on the existing setup of the building. Um, and because the, the simplest connection, the one that draws you right to the front door of the building um, is difficult to accomplish um, the appropriate grade. And because the least expensive and grade, um, grade compliant connection is at the other end of the building. We think this proof of connectivity agreement gives us the flexibility, number one, to measure uh, the actual pedestrian access that's happening on the site. And number two, to make, um, uh, you know, referencing back to where people actually are walking across the parking lot and walking across to access the brewery. Um, and, and you might find in other properties where there's a more significant redevelopment of an existing site that you would see these connections mandated as a code compliant issue. But in this case, because this is actually a, only a small component of what is actually in the building as a whole, um, you don't have that as a code requirement. Rather, it's this sort of discretionary uh, condition that is added simply because um, we know this about the use in general. Um, and so in terms of the nexus between the request um, uh, to have the conditional use permit and to operate the facility at this site, you know, I think this proof of parking agreement or proof of parking agreement, this proof of connectivity agreement really gives you the ability to have strong legal standing um, to require this if it is needed based upon the professional estimation of your traffic staff, um, you know, when, uh, when that data is collected. Um, and to put it in a place that's safe and meets the property owner's concerns about safety for people accessing his site. All right, uh, thank you. Appreciate that information. Um, any questions for Ms. Rogers? Just want to make sure. I, I'm One question, and maybe this confuses the issue again. So, uh, Ms. Rogers, if we determine there's a need, is there any liability with a, de determining a threshold and our ADA uh, requirements, or uh, in this case, the property owner's ADA compliance. Yeah, and and so what what I so we can we can start from the beginning that any connection must be, be ADA compliant. Yep. Um, and so so we know that um, as our starting point. Um, but then the question is how the site is is used and how its use is demonstrated. Um, and I think the flexibility this agreement gives you is to say that, you know, if staff is seeing uh, a significant increase in the pedestrian access to this site, 
that then there's a good reason and there's a market-driven reason for the property owner to in install um, this additional connection. Um, and, and, you know, I think that Mr. Roberts gave a good um, analysis between those 8 to 20 trips um, that can be included and negotiated with a property owner and staff um, in, in the agreement itself. But I think that the direction that you've given staff is very clear in terms of what you want to see demonstrated in this agreement. Um, and you've been very clear about what um, the expectation is for the property owner as well. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rogers. Appreciate that. All right, Commission members, uh, hearing Ms. Rogers, um, anybody want to move forward on this one? Commissioner Cookton? I think I'd, um, thank you, Mr. Chair, just like a little bit more clarification on the difference between the 8 and 20 and the 5 to 10 percent. Okay, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Roberts, just uh, maybe an explanation of what those two numbers represent. And right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Cookton, the, the, Numbers are the percentages multiplied by the trips. Um, so essentially you could go, what I would recommend if those are being put to an agreement is that we just use the range of trips, not the percentages, um, because that gets into what some other factors that, that, we, that are gonna add more details that are unnecessary. Um, so the, the reason I gave the range 18 up to 20 is to give the, the commission some sense of, of how many trips would be significant there and to give you maybe a, a working start if you want to set a number out there as the threshold. Um, consider it somewhere in this range. So I hope that puts some context to it. Yes, it does. Thank you. Right. So eight was the number eight? Eight was the, the low end. That's about 5% of the okay. expected vehicle trips up to... Uh, Ten percent is the higher number, up to twenty. So that will you, uh, you hearing that, and uh, I think uh, the council or the commission understanding those numbers. Um, that's something you would use to negotiate the agreement. Got it. Thank you. All right, um, Commissioner Roman. I was. I, I think we exhausted. I have exhausted most of this. I don't know if others have thoughts. Um, you know, I think the only, my only other comment, and it's more of a comment, it's not really, it doesn't affect this, is, you know, the question that uh, the applicant raised about, you know, whether or not it was safe to walk from the other end of the, the well, if it's not safe, then it's not safe to walk to your car then either. Right. So, yep. um, again, I, I defer to staff's judgment on this. I think we've covered it. I think, as Ms. Rogers said, um, we've made it clear what we would like to see out of this from both sides of this. So if there's no objection from my colleagues, I would be willing to make a motion. Uh, in case PL 2021-193, I move to adapt a resolution revising condition of approval number eight in case PL 2021-109 to the following. Uh, number eight, ongoing. By January 31, 2022, the property owner must enter into a proof of pedestrian connectivity agreement with the city. 18 months after a certificate of occupancy is issued for the tap room, city staff and the applicant must meet and discuss pedestrian connectivity requirements. Second. All right, Commission members, is there a second? Commissioner Goldsman? Second. All right, uh, Commission members, we have a motion in front of us and a second to adopt a resolution revising condition of approval number eight in case PL 2021-109 in the following, to the following, number eight ongoing. By January 31st, 2022, the property owner must enter into a proof of pedestrian connectivity agreement with the city. 18 months after a certificate of occupancy is issued for the tap room, city staff and the applicant must meet and discuss pedestrian connectivity requirements. Is there any further discussion on that? Not seeing any. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those nay? No. One no. All right. Motion passes. Four to one. Um, and that is a final decision unless an appeal is received by 4.30 p.m. on October 19th, 2021. All right, uh, moving on to item number four, which is Planning Commission Policy and Issue Update. Mr. Markergaard. Sure. Uh, Mr. Chair, just looking forward at your next uh, three Planning Commission meetings. Uh, next meeting will be in two weeks, October 28th. Uh, we do have several items on that agenda, uh, namely a subdivision, small one, uh, two lots, or one lot into two lots. We have the Southtown uh, redevelopment item that was continued from your last meeting. 
uh, we would have the uh, code amendment that was continued from tonight's meeting. And then uh, two study items, uh, namely a discussion of single family and two family uh, dwelling standards and a discussion of ADU standards, uh, mm -hmm. both uh, being considered for update. So that's October 28th. And then uh, November 4th would be the meeting after that. Uh, kind of a transportation night, uh, three items. Update on the 494 project. Uh, secondly, a code amendment to rename 28th Avenue. And third, a, a study item to discuss pavement management program, future project scoping. And looking at uh, one more meeting out, November 18th, uh, we have the review of the uh, capital improvement plan for uh, compliance with a comprehensive plan. Um, we have a stu secondly, study item to discuss residential livability standards. So thinking about things like generators, chillers, uh, things like that near residential. And that's all we have on November 18th so far. All right, thank you, Mr. Mark Gerd. Um, and Mr. Mark Gerd, I don't know, do you wanna give an update on uh, our item from last meeting regarding the uh, next 10? Or uh, sorry, uh, net, net, network next? Network next, sure. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, recall the Planning Commission requested the city to prepare a letter to transmit to uh, Metro Transit and Met Council. Uh, we did prepare that. I believe you have a copy of that letter. Uh, was discussed uh, yesterday uh, evening or late afternoon. And ultimately, the Met Council did uh, uh, move forward with the network next uh, recommendation, which would uh, remove American Boulevard from that list, um, setting the stage for potential removal from the transportation policy plan, the update of which is uh, just starting. Um, we continue to have conversations with Metro Transit staff on um, ideas for keeping it in the transportation policy plan. Uh, so that continues to move forward. Um, so while we didn't, uh, the Met Council didn't necessarily go Bloomington's way, we do have at least a little bit of optimism that it uh, could still be retained in the transportation policy plan. Okay, thank you. All right, commission members, any uh, issues or um, policy uh, or direction for staff to think about for upcoming, not uh, agenda items, but in general? And we had a lot of discussion tonight about what, what things could happen, but uh, Commissioner Abdi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think the first agenda item had, has me thinking a lot about, we're on item number four, right? Uh, item number four, okay, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, about um, nonconformity uh, uh, in terms of building design versus adapted plans. And I don't know if that kind of meets what you're thinking. I'm just throwing ideas in terms so of what I'm thinking about. Is there, are there is there changes that conflict, might, yeah. might need to be made? Yeah, like if we, we do adopt these plans and they become policies for us to guide development and reviews, uh, but we come across um, challenges in, especially in this area around the first item that, you know, if they do decide to retrofit their buildings but not necessarily change the characteristics uh, and they, they stick with their nonconformity, then are we not meeting the plan adopted to guide this area? So I'm... Mm -hmm. Like the the crossroad that we were at earlier, and you know, that how do we move forward with something that we want to see for the area while also having uh, the the property owners' rights to nonconformity, and for them to choose to, you know, retrofit their buildings, but the city also has this plan that says we need to see buildings to the street or whatever that means. Um, so then, what do we pick and choose as commission? Then do we go with the nonconformity rights, um, or do we stick to our guns and say no matter what, you have to comply with uh, adopted plans? Or so I guess I'm I'm struggling here. Should we see new applications again? Um, 
All right, Commissioner Abbey. So maybe uh, would would things such as maybe additional study items to clarify those, or thinking, or are you thinking maybe more about additional tools that staff could look at um, that would advance some of these plans um, faster uh, within the ordinance? I'd say just both. Uh, I'm, okay. I'm not sure what the end result would be. At the, at the end of the day, I think we're because we are the ones making these recommendations moving forward and the council has the final say. Mm -hmm. um, as the decision-making body, you know, I, what I would be looking for is one, consistency, and two, um, what is the purpose of a plan that we have worked hard enough to adopt it and we see beautiful expectations of how our corridors should look like and yet we have things like nonconformity um, that would be a hurdle to accomplishing. And I know the nonconformity is out, out of the city's scope to say we need to change it there, you know, for it to match our plans. But when it comes to reviewing, and I know staff has made recommendations to move forward the applications, considering that there was nonconformity, but also there was uh, recognizing that there were adopted plans that were not being met based on the design guidelines that were in the plan. So. If, plan, if, if staff is recommending these approvals, recognizing these challenges, then should we? I, I get, I'm questioning myself here. Is mm -hmm. then what are what guidelines are we setting in terms of like future applications? Um, and by you know 15, 10 years from now, mm -hmm. is the corridor still going to be the same? And is the plan useless to some extent? So is what I'm trying to get at. So yeah, I don't no, know if this I, makes any sense. <laughs> no, it makes sense, uh, Commissioner Abdi, and I might even uh, I might just suggest uh, as a starting point maybe just a uh, a staff overview of of how those two mix a little better as a study item mm -hmm. at some point in the future um, to give more clarity to the planning commission uh, in order to make good informed decisions moving forward. So we could start with that, and then if there's and that's why we're adding these in at the end of our meeting so that we can grow as a planning commission. So, all right. Any other uh, uh, thoughts or uh, clarifications, questions from commission members? Otherwise, uh, that uh, is the end of item number four and concludes the October 14th, 2021 planning commission meeting. Thank you all.